it's 7.03, I think we'll get, uh, get started. So I'd like to call this special meeting of the Board of Education to order. Uh, and if we could please get the flag, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, which stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. All right, so thank you everybody for attending uh, our special meeting. Um, this is a business meeting of the Board of Ed. Before I start, just uh, talk about a few things to help us out. So this meeting is uh, probably the last uh, being conducted pursuant to the Governor's Executive Order 7B. Uh, per that order, we're actually recording the meeting as well as streaming it online. Uh, and videos of that will be found on our webpage. Uh, you know, feel free to uh, like it on our YouTube channel. Uh, for those paying attention, our, our May meeting will likely be at Central Middle School in person. So uh, for the folks that are on now, I'll just uh, announce that just so you know. Um, more details forthcoming on that. Uh, but the agenda for the meeting tonight is found on our board docs website. You can get there by going to greenwichschools.org, clicking on Board of Education, uh, and then you see the meetings box. If you click that, it'll take you over to board docs and you can click on tonight's uh, meeting to get the agenda. Uh, we're taking public comments tonight. We've got 13 speakers signed up. Uh, if you didn't get an opportunity to sign up, you can always send an email to the entire Board of Education by sending a single email to boardofedmembers at greenwich.k12.ct.us. Again, that's boardofedmembers at greenwich.k12.ct.us. Uh, the meeting tonight is going to consist of discussion uh, by and among the superintendent, board members, uh, the administrative team, and I don't know if we, we've got some uh, guests joining us for, uh, for some special recognitions, which is great. Um, I'd ask everybody to please stay on mute when they're not speaking. Uh, I'd ask participants to state their name every time they speak, unless I've uh, called on you. We need to do that for the record. Uh, we'll be using the raise the hand function when we get to our discussion, uh, and I'd ask board members to keep their, uh, their comments concise so that everybody, everybody gets an opportunity to speak and any voting will be done by roll call. Okay, thank you for uh, sticking with us. I know a lot of you have heard that uh, a number of times. So uh, the first, uh, the next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Mr. Kelly, is there a second? I'll second it. Ms. Ms. Hirsch. All right. I'm gonna take a uh, roll call vote on the consent agenda. Just making sure there's no hands. All right, Bernstein is a yes. Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? Yes. Downey? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Kowalski? Yes. Olson? Yes. And Cher? Yes. Thank you. That passes eight zero. All right, so this is a, uh, a fun time. We've got actually some staff recognition tonight uh, joining us are Diana Urbanowski and Brian Zeller, the uh, PTA uh, co-presidents at Central Middle School. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for letting us acknowledge our amazing principal, Tom Healy. Brian and I are so happy that the Connecticut PTA has awarded him the Outstanding Administrator Middle School Principal 2021. We are excited for him. He has been amazing this year, as well as really all of our um, Greenwich Public School staff, administration. This was a really tough year. We all waited with bated breath to see how we were gonna get back. Tom Healy has been 24 seven responsive to everyone. We received a lot of outpouring of love for him. A 45 page nomination packet with a video was sent over to the Connecticut PTA. Um, and he won. <laughs> so we are very excited. We thank everyone who wrote in, who sent videos. We also thank the Connecticut PTA for, um, for sponsoring this award this year. We know there were many deserving candidates and we know that it was a tough decision for them. So we thank them for pouring through countless probably submissions and we are super excited. I hope Tom is on here. We just want to congratulate him. Um, and we think it's great for the community. It's great for Greenwich. It's great for Tom and us. Thank you. Brian, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add. Nope, Brian's all good. Just on a, uh, a personal note, Mr. Healy started at Central when uh, when my oldest started at the middle school. And, uh, you know, we're leaving at the end of this year uh, to head to the high school with our, uh, our youngest. But, uh, you know, we're going to miss Central. Uh, it's been a great experience, Mr. Healy, with you at the, uh, at the helm. So uh, congratulations to you for your recognition. 
All right, with that, our next item is the 2021 Distinguished Teachers. Catherine Benetti. Hi, Peter. Good evening, members of the Board of Education, superintendent, members of the cabinet, and to all who have joined this meeting. My name is Kathy Bernetti, and I'm the chair of the Distinguished Teachers Award Committee. I have the distinct pleasure to share with you our six distinguished teachers for this year. Before I do that, I would like to acknowledge our outgoing committee members, Board of Education Representative Megan Olson, Jean Schmidt, our Gosher Rep, our Treasurer, Cindy Lyle, and Christine Edwards, our Kiwanis Rep. They have all given so much of their time and energy to recognize and support our teachers. So thank you very much. Now to introduce our six distinguished teachers. These teachers are amazing educators and in reviewing their nominations, it has been incredible to see the impact that they have had on their students, colleagues and school communities. Please join me in congratulating Jennifer Bresler, a district secondary instructional coach, Jennifer Dunn, North, North Miami school fourth grade teacher, Allison Fallon, Central Middle School English Language Arts teacher, Bruce Johnson, Eastern Middle School Science and Mathematics teacher, Jane Martellino, International School at Dundee Library Media Specialist, and Susan Zerman, North Street School third grade teacher. Congratulations to these six teachers. We are honored to recognize you and look forward to celebrating you further on in the future on Tuesday, May 4th at our virtual Zoom ceremony. I encourage everyone to join us for that special occasion. Thank you again and congratulations to all. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks to the committee. I, I know it's a lot of work. I read a lot of submissions on, uh, on our amazing teachers and it's not always easy picking six. So looking forward to the ceremony on the fourth. Fabulous, thank you. Thank you. All right, so our next item is our public hearing. Uh, we're gonna start with comments from our GHS student government. Do we have Mark and Meredith with us? Meredith, you should be able to talk. Hello. Okay, awesome. Um, hello to all the members of the board and to the people observing the meeting tonight. My name is Meredith Blanchard and I'm the GHS senior class president. I want to thank you all again for graciously devoting time to student voices at each meeting. Coming out of spring break and charging ahead into quarter four, I have some updates to share. First, I wanted to express continued excitement about our ability to move forward with both proms and graduation. Seniors and juniors are like are are thrilled to have the opportunity for a more traditional spring celebration. I also wanted to thank Dr. Jones for working with the Community Health Center of Stanford in order to open up GHS specific vaccine slots. For many students, navigating the VAM system proved to be difficult. And I believe that this clinic will likely accelerate the rate at which Greenwich High School students may be vaccinated. While a vaccine is not mandated, I believe that every shot contributes toward making our school community safer and one step closer to opening up fully again. On the subject of opening school up fully again, I want to express a desire among specifically the senior class to be back in school together again. During our last months as Greenwich students, many seniors wish to have a special community moment with each other. What this would ideally look like would be one week where only seniors attend in-person school. To ask underclassmen to learn remotely from home for a week may seem extreme, but it is actually only a difference of two days because a given cohort is actually only in person for two days at a time. I ask you to consider this as an option to honor our seniors and the last year and a half of regular school that they missed out on. I will wrap up by stating that I am incredibly optimistic for this spring and for the gradual return to a sense of normalcy. Thank you all again for supporting our school community. I will now, will now turn the mic over to our student body president, Mark Chen. Uh, good evening, Chairman Bernstein, Dr. Jones, members of the board, cabinet, and meeting attendees. My name is Mark Chen, student body president at Greenwich High School. I remember saying this back in January or February, but time really does go by so fast. Uh, we're already approaching the end of April. 
Uh, the election process for student government officers, including its executive committee, is well underway and will conclude at the end of May. So hopefully we will be joined by the new student body president and senior class president in our June meeting. Greenwich High School students are grateful to Mr. Mayo and our school administration for making the right decision to not have finals this year. It would have been extremely challenging to ensure an equitable experience in a hybrid model alongside the fact that we did not have midterms either. And as Teacher Appreciation Week nears, we are hoping to do a gratitude week where students can fill out gratitude grams to be sent to faculty and staff, similar to the process we coordinated around Valentine's Day earlier this year. A possible theme day we were brainstorming was Meditation Monday, where Mr. Mayo would lead Greenwich High School through a guided meditation. And I truly hope that we can make this happen. And finally, the second annual Live Like Luke Beach Cleanup will be taking place at Todd's Point this Saturday from 11 to 3 in honor of former GHS student Luke Myers and his passion for environmentalism. In continuing my discussion of some longer standing topics of interest from our last meeting, I'd like to discuss briefly the future of Opportunity Block at GHS. As a sophomore, I was on the Opportunity Block Stakeholder Committee where we reflected upon the very first year of OB and its quite rigid implementation. My junior year, which was last year, more freedoms were afforded to students with seniors being able to leave at 2.45 and athletes being allowed to go to practice. OB was certainly not as much of a topic of discussion this year as it was in the past, largely because other priorities took precedence and the early staggered dismissal model greatly shortened its length anyways. Nevertheless, the fact, this fact of our GHS schedule is one that is important to consider as we move into a more normal next year. I still believe that an unstructured period of time brings great value to students. We did, after all, go through the laborious process of implementing this in the first place. What I would like to emphasize about OB, though, is that there have been so many discussions already held in the past and many different solutions proposed. I'm thinking most prominently of former GHS students and student government executive committee members Lucas Gazianis and Toby Hirsch, who are fierce advocates for OB reformation. While we should certainly gather the latest feedback, we also do not need to repeat the same conversations. This is a perfect opportunity for positive innovation and we can and should improve what exists. Thank you for your time tonight. It is always a pleasure. Thank you very much, Mark and Meredith. Appreciate your comments. I can't believe the uh, elections are already happening. You're already talking about the end of the year. This went fast. Um, next up is the GEA comments, Carol Sutton. Good evening, board members, Dr. Jones, cabinet, and members of the Greenwich Public School community on Zoom. My name is Carol Sutton, and I'm honored to represent 900 members of the Greenwich Education Association. Congratulations to this evening's faculty honorees, particularly the class of 2021 distinguished teachers, Jennifer Dunn, Jen Bressler, Allison Fallon, Bruce Johnson, Jane Martellino, and Susan Zerman. These six professionals epitomize the qualities that make Greenwich educators the best of the best. <clears throat> they are lifelong learners who inspire their students and their colleagues each and every day. They contribute to their schools and communities and introduce their students to a world of people and ideas that, though vast, is increasingly accessible to all through the internet. We are so proud of these teachers and we look forward to further celebration on May 4th. We also congratulate Tom Healy, principal of Central Middle School. It's been a while since Tom was a social studies teacher at GHS, but I know his experience in the classroom contributed greatly to his success as a principal. And while we're congratulating this evening's honorees, I wanna give a well-deserved shout out to every teacher administrator and staff member in our schools. They have all distinguished themselves during the past year by adapting to pandemic education and showing up for the students. It has not been easy and we're not out of the woods as much as we would like to be. We trust that Dr. Jones and her team will continue to enforce COVID safety protocols so that we can end the school year safely. We're excited on the vote for on the new mathematics program and appreciate the prominent role that teachers played on the textbook review committee. We're also eager to hear the update on the board strategic plan, since that will inform our work in the coming years. We're also eager for the calendar to be set because everyone wants to know when the last day of school is. We are wondering though about the agenda item called curriculum implementation, which was added to this agenda recently. 
After 35 years in the district, here's what I know about curriculum implementation. Every day, hundreds of Greenwich educators teach to their program and grade level curriculum with standards, essential questions, required core texts, and supplemental materials. They create lessons based on best practices and emerging trends and use a multitude of strategies to engage their students with the hope that their teaching will not just stick, but motivate, inspire, and even set a course for a student's future. Sometimes a lesson flops or an application is over the kids' heads, but teachers are professionals. They confer with colleagues and administrators, they assess, they learn from their mistakes, they adapt and adjust for the next lesson or unit, and their instruction evolves. The curriculum evolves too, according to policy and established practices. And by most measures Greenwich, measures, Greenwich is a wonderful school system with solid student outcomes. That's why many teachers are wondering whether today's review of curriculum implementation is truly the most pressing issue for the Board of Ed right now. I've reached the end of my time, so thank you for providing a place for GEA to speak each month, and we look forward to a productive meeting. I'll send additional comments in writing. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. All right, next up is PTA Council, uh, Brian Paul Dunas. Good evening. Brian, you are unmuted. Yep, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Good evening. I am Brian Paul Dunas, President of PTA Council, representing the 15 school PTAs and the families of all of their members. PTA Council congratulates Tom Healy on being awarded the 2021 Connecticut PTA Outstanding Administrator Award for a middle school principal. Try to fit that on the award plaque. Uh, we also offer our congratulations to all of our 2021 outstanding teachers. Thank you and thank you to all of our teachers and staff for your efforts on behalf of our students, especially in this most interesting year. And thank you to the Central Middle School PTA for putting Mr. Healy's name forward. Next Thursday, April 29th, PTA Council and the League of Women Voters, along with the Greenwich Public Schools, are sponsoring a discussion on fixing Greenwich Public Schools infrastructure. Go to the League of Women Voters website to register and to ask a question or two. <clears throat> Speaking of infra infrastructure, PTA Council asks all parties involved to work to expedite the repairs to North Mayanna School. We recognize there are differences of opinion about the appropriate process but we reiterate the belief that our students are best served educationally and emotionally by being in their own school building as soon as possible. As always, some follow-up items. We urge the board to support GPS as they explore steps to alleviate Chromebook issues, particularly at the high school level. We continue to emphasize the desi desirability of placing additional updated or corrected information requested by the Board of Education on the district website in a location easily accessible to all, preferably linked to the original board doc. Finally, we reiterate PTA Council's desire to participate in the needed follow-on work as described in the ALP report. On tonight's agenda, PTA Council welcomes the much needed focus on curriculum development, implementation, consistency, excellence, and transparency. The Academic Excellence Committee will be speaking later this evening to provide more thoughts on this topic. Clearly, curriculum is at the heart of what we all want for our students, a good education. Also on tonight's agenda is a preview of a community survey to assist the Strategic Planning Committee. We look forward to the discussion of the survey, and we have a few suggestions to assist clarity for survey takers, which we'll, we will relay offline. Finally, last month I spoke about the academic and social emotional issues facing students, as well as the need to look forward or to look beyond COVID. We look forward to further updates on plans for this fall. And as an added note, as we, we sincerely hope that even with in-person meetings, hopefully starting again next uh, month, that virtual attendance will still be available and town residents will, will continue to attend either in-person or virtually. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Brian. Um, all right, next up we have our community comments. Uh, I wanna remind speakers that they get, per our policy, it's policy 9325. Uh, each speaker gets three minutes. Uh, I would ask that you please be respectful. Um, 
We can offer objective criticism of district operation and programs, but we encourage you uh, to address complaints concerning individuals uh, through the uh, proper chain of command. Uh, speakers can express themselves in a civil manner with due respect for dignity and, and privacy of others who may be affected by their comments. Uh, you have to be aware that uh, statements that violate the rights of others under the law of defamation or invasion of privacy, the speaker could be held personally liable. So I just want to remind you of that. Uh, we just ask, uh, please be civil and uh, we'll try to stop you if you're not and give you some guidance. All right, with that, our first speaker is Teresa Hirsch. You just need to unmute. Based on the email uh, sign up, I have a Kevin Hirsch. Um, I okay. believe that is yep, them. Kevin, yep, Kevin, you just need to unmute. Okay, we'll, we'll give you another uh, second to figure that out. Um, all right, somehow we seem to have lost you. We'll, we'll look for you again in a little bit. We'll come back to you. Uh, next speaker is Jackie Homan. Mr. Bernstein, I want to know why you personally failed to uphold your own strict code of ethics and why you allowed an employee to promote misinformation about COVID vaccines to the Greenwich community. I want to know why you failed to take action over this serious issue, Peter, and instead issued me a GFY letter and ignored my repeated requests to provide complete and truthful information based on facts sourced directly from the CDC and the vaccine manufacturers themselves, just like Tony ignored me and just like the PTA ignored me. So much for living in a community that allegedly values diversity and inclusion. Your opinions only matter if you share the same liberal views espoused by the majority of the people who populate the board and fill the seats in the PTA, but your voice gets silenced if you find yourself amongst the group of parents like me who are horrified at the changes we're seeing in our schools, horrified at the disgusting, inappropriate, sexualized content being presented to our children, horrified that the high school athletic coaches are pressuring teenagers into becoming part of a medical experiment for fear they'll get sidelined and bullied by their peers, horrified that our teenagers are being unlawfully denied summer employment unless they take the unapproved experimental vaccine. I have repeatedly provided information to you, Peter, sourced directly from the CDC and the manufacturers of the vaccines themselves, clearly demonstrating that Dr. Noble and subsequently Dr. Jones have lied about the vaccines to parents. In Tony's own words, she sees no difference between the terms FDA approved and emergency use authorization. The difference is meaningful. The Nuremberg Code exists to stop people from unwittingly becoming part of a medical experiment, which is exactly what people are doing when they take the unapproved experimental mRNA gene therapies described by the manufacturer manufacturer as the software of life. These are not vaccines in the traditional sense, and the clinical trials aren't due to share results until 2023. That is exactly how you know that you become part of a medical experiment. Just read the package inserts and learn for yourself. I already sent them to you, conveniently highlighted, so that you can see the shocking words for yourself if you bother to look. Instead though, you've allowed a town employee who's not even from our community of Greenwich to directly email students and tell them to seek vaccination without their parents' knowledge. Our schools should never have a role in dividing parents and their children. And that is exactly what Tony is doing when she emails students directly. The potential legal risk she is imposing on the district with her reckless communications that lack all informed consent is frightening. Like all other medical interventions, vaccines should be a personal medical decision, not a decision influenced by a school employee with a track record of misinformation. Peter, did you already have warning signs about Tony Jones' character and ethics when you did due diligence in the hiring process? Did you look at what Fairfield County Schools said or what Falls Church City said? Because apparently she's had some issues before. So I'm putting thank the board of ed on notice time. for allowing the shameful right. behavior to Michael, take Michael, can we please turn? Thank you. Thank you very much. I will again remind speakers of our policy. If you can't be civil, we will turn your microphone off. We don't want to do that. So please do uh, take that into account. 
Our next speaker is Anna Laborde. Now, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. My name is Anna Laborde and I, along with Jessica and Wright Polanish, are the co-chairs of PTA Council's Academic Excellence Committee. Our committee advocates for excellence in the GPS curriculum across the entire district and promotes family engagement and student learning by facilitating communication between the schools and parents. We chose to speak tonight based on our ongoing work with and in support of Mr. D'Amico and his presentation to the board. Our committee has members from all 15 schools and our mandate from them is clear. Parents want consistency, transparency, and excellence. First, there should be consistency and in instruction across grades and schools. Fourth graders at New Lab should be learning the same lessons using the same vetted resources as fourth graders at Parkway. One twin should not spend their entire year writing in cursive while the other twin down the hall spends only two weeks. That is not equitable instruction. We need an established curriculum that is taught with fidelity across classrooms and schools and all subject areas. Foundations and Big Ideas Math are examples of what we would like to see across the board. Second, we want transparency and communication in regards to curriculum information shared with parents. While we have the utmost faith in our teachers and administrators as the experts that they are, many GPS parents today, especially in K-5, do not know what their kids are learning. We do not wanna tell our teachers how or what to teach, but we do want to know how we can support our children parents need more transparency and communication regarding curriculum in the form of online syllabi, web pages, newsletters, and additional parent-teacher conference. Third, we want excellence in our GPS teaching and learning. We know this is happening in many and most classrooms, but there are gaps that must be addressed. Parents are concerned about skipped units in middle school math, the rigor of our writing curriculum, and why our kids are not learning to type or write cursive, among other things. We are so grateful for our incredibly talented teachers in this district who have been working tirelessly during this pandemic and years prior. To them, we say thank you. We need to show that appreciation by giving them the tools they deserve to achieve excellence, professional development, vetted materials, and curriculum maps with lessons of what to teach and when. They cannot be simultaneously searching for or creating the curriculum while teaching it. We commend GPS's decision to conduct ongoing curriculum research development and writing throughout the year, as well as having the appropriate teachers involved. Through, through many conversations with Mr. D'Amico, Jessica and I have come to understand that his goals are very much aligned with ours. We agree that excellence can only be achieved and evaluated when curriculum is implemented across the district with fidelity. We know that many of these academic efforts take time and require funding from the budget. Our PTAC committee looks forward to our continued work with Mr. D'Amico, and we hope that the board will join us in prioritizing and funding consistency, transparency, and excellence in Greenwich Public Schools. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Stephanie Cowie. Good evening, Chairman Bernstein, Superintendent Dr. Jones and Board of Ed members. I'm Steph Cowie and Terry Lamonti and I are currently the co-presidents at Greenwich High School. It certainly has been a challenging year filled with surprises for all of us. It's hard to believe that we are now in the last semester of school for our seniors, juniors, sophomores, and freshmen. We are so thankful to all of you for keeping our kids safe and in school. We continue to recognize the North Mianus community and support all of your efforts for a speedy return to school for our North Miami students. And a congratulations to Tom Healy is being recognized by Connecticut PTA top middle school administrator, as well as all of the distinguished teachers. As a discussion of a building committee is on your agenda this evening, we hope that you envision a member of the Greenwich High School PTA as an active member of the building committee. The completion of this entire project is very important to the GHS community. As we have previously stated, this stadium shouldn't be half built. Phase two, including the visitor side bleachers, new visitor side building, and the important second egress exit roadway for Greenwich High School cannot be forgotten. We look forward to hearing more this evening regarding our seniors, possibly returning to school and graduation. Our seniors and their families have been through so very much this past year. We hope that they experience some time together as a class at Greenwich High School, as well as an in-person graduation surrounded by their family and friends. 
Our seniors are very deserving of these experiences and we know this can be achieved in a safe manner. On behalf of our seniors and their families, we thank you for your thoughtful planning and return to school and an in-person graduation. We also thank you all for your continued efforts and support of our children, faculty, administrators. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening. All right, thank you very much, Steph. The next speaker is Francis Wu Nobe. Good evening, this is Francis Wu Nobe, PTAC Remote Schools Special Committee Co-Chair. Our remote learners and GPS teams teaching high flex and remotely have made it to the last marking period. Thank you for all your efforts in this unprecedented year. Did you catch the remote learner counts in Dr. Jones's March family note? As of March 23rd, there were still 439 students remote learning at the elementary level. That's down just 78 students from the October 22nd BOE meeting, placing the remote school as the third largest elementary school after North Vianus and Riverside schools. At the secondary school level, the counts are far above what was reported in October. The count on March 23rd was 1,348 students, up 522 students since October due to a large number of fully remote high schoolers. As we look ahead, our remote learning families are looking forward to re-entry programs to reacclimate, reconnect, and re-energize our neighborhood school communities. In the meanwhile, we make the most of our remote learning experience. We are so very grateful to the Greenwich Alliance for Education for fully funding virtual assemblies for our grade K through five remote learners. In April, our remote learners will enjoy an entertaining program on poetry, and we especially thank GPS's Anthony Stempion for logging on from paternity leave to run that program. In May, the remote school received additional funding to offer science and social studies assemblies tied to the curriculum. Thank you, Greenwich Alliance for Education and the many Greenwich families who contributed to make these programs happen. Two more remote school shout outs, one to the boys who have been running a weekly Friday at noon virtual social club to help our remote learners connect. The last session was attended by nearly 40 students and we are so appreciative of this social connection. The other shout out is to Danny Rossi, Costco PTA president and remote school parent volunteer. Danny is leading our remote school teacher appreciation week efforts and we look forward to uh, supporting these uh, special teachers. Lastly, mark your calendar. On Friday, May 7th at nine o'clock, the remote school is hosting a parent meeting via Zoom with the GPS team. Please ping me or your remote school parent volunteer for registration details. To close, Please stay safe, stay healthy, and let's end the year strong. We are one school community. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we can try again. I think it was Kevin Hirsch. We can find Kevin if he's on. I now have a Rose Hirsch. Are you the- Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear Who's me? Who's this? Can yes. you please state your okay. name? Yes, this is Teresa Hirsch. I'm sorry for the confusion. Oh, no worries. Okay, good evening, Greenwich community, elected school board officials and Chairman Bernstein. Thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. I wanna to begin by mentioning how much our family absolutely loves Greenwich Public Schools and teachers. It is an amazing school district, but we have personally felt a gap in this education experience. This evening, I wanna follow up on a disturbing seven minute internet video, which described child rape to over 40 of our GPS seven and eight year old students on April 9th during social emotional learning class. Despite the serious nature of this incident, to this day, Greenwich public school officials led by Tony Jones have not come forward with any strategy to avoid a repeat of this type of incident. Specifically, Tony Jones told the parents in two separate Zoom calls that what teachers did was 100% legal and there was no way that she could possibly limit any of the educational information taken from the internet or YouTube and used by teachers throughout our school district. First, I ask you to consider that if Greenwich Public Schools are using the lowest possible bar, that is what is 100% legal, as a boundary for what internet material can be used for educational plans in our classrooms, this type of incident will definitely happen again. It appears that the internet freedom that Tony Jones has given our teachers has set them up to fail. 
without simple access to pre-approved internet video curriculum materials, 40 children have lost two teachers this year. One teacher with many years of experience and one brand new teacher just starting a career. Second, despite the losses to our families and GPS, Tony Jones said clearly she sees no need for a policy change to support teachers in this area. Unfortunately, second grade parents have not heard anything from the GPS head of K-8 curriculum, Mark D'Amico. He has not written one email to our classes to restore our faith in the social emotional curriculum guidelines. What if it had been a graphic video about a school shooting shown to our second graders? Would we be changing internet policy? It feels like GPS staff is giving child sexual assault a free pass here. In 2021, when hundreds of specific educational YouTube channel subscriptions are available, certainly Greenwich Public Schools can identify a staff leader to provide our teachers with guidelines and easy access to excellent curriculum internet materials. Finally, please give the parents of these two affected classes a private platform or survey to tell the BOE about the response of GPS leaders throughout this experience with our children. This disturbing event was national news. It was an embarrassment to Greenwich Public Schools and the larger community. I ask you, who can lead GPS and come up with secure educational internet strategy to protect both our young children and our teachers? Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, our next speaker is Gary Wisiewski, and I probably mispronounced your name, Gary, so I'm gonna apologize for that. Gary, if you could raise your hand so we could find you. All right, not seeing Gary. All right, we'll move on to our next speaker then, uh, Silka Ulrich. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Dear members of the BOE and parents, my name is Silka Ulrich and I am the parent of three children in the Greenwich Public Schools. I also sit on the PTA board at North Mayanis. However, I am speaking this evening as a parent and not as a representative of the PTA. I'm very concerned about the amount of emails I am receiving from GPS regarding vaccinating our students. This is not only inappropriate, but it opens up our district to exposure. Medical decisions are a private family matter, period. It is not up to the school to promote any medical decisions, especially those that aren't fully approved by the FDA and are still in the clinical trial phase. Please refer to the FDA website where it clearly states it is an emergency use approval and therefore cannot be mandated. This is not a discussion on whether or not to take what's being called a vaccination. I myself, as well as my children, are vaccinated in full for measles and all the other required FDA-approved vaccinations by the schedule provided by our community medical practitioners. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. However, our schools do not have any right to promote any medical decision, especially directly with emails to students, without parents' knowledge or consent. In fact, GPS is going a step further by bribing students with no quarantining after exposure, travel, et cetera. It's unacceptable. Furthermore, coaches have been telling players that without this vaccination, they will be sidelined. And now we have gone from bribery to outright discrimination. All it takes is for one student to have a deadly or severe reaction and the school will have a lawsuit on their hands as the pharmaceuticals have you sign a hold harmless agreement when you take the shot. This is your responsibility, Chairman of the Board, Mr. Bernstein, and the BOE. This is not something that the superintendent should be communicating to our GPS community. You should not be coming between parents and children. You should not be advising on private medical decisions. You should not be bribing students to take this experimental shot. You should not be discriminating against anyone for any reason. GPS is overstepping. GPS should be focusing on the curriculum as it relates to reading, writing, and math. GPS should be figuring out why half our students are failing and what they're going to do about it. 
oh, you didn't know? Well, maybe that's where your energy is better spent and where your accountability lies. That's it. Okay, thank you. All right, our next speaker is Michael D'Angelo. Hi, good evening. Um, for the most part, many of my concerns have already been addressed. Um, the one thing I would like to uh, just put up here as something that should be discussed further, and I would really appreciate, this is, I'm new to this forum, um, appreciate that parents be completely kept in the loop. It, you know, communication is really, really key. But um, just with specific uh, uh, mandate on masks in schools, I really think this should start to be revisited because these hours and hours that our children are wearing masks constantly uh, just does not seem to be supported by the science. Um, most egregious in this, I feel, is outdoor sports. These kids are athletes. They are forced to wear masks. And I truly just don't believe this is at all healthy. I won't take up a lot more time with this. I just wanted to get it out there on the record. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much and appreciate the uh, brevity. Uh, the next speaker is Kara Philbin. And if I got Kara wrong, I'm sorry. I do not have a Kara. Kara, if you're with us, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand. Okay, we have somebody logged in as parent. You are unmuted. Oh, Can thank you. Please you. state your name. Hi, thank you. Um, sorry, I didn't realize you had to unmute me. Okay. Um, can you, can you please state your name just to make sure? Uh, sure, Kara Philbin. Thank you, perfect. Um, please go ahead. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm sorry, but you just killed my, <laughs> all right. Thank, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, as defined by the mother of four vaccinated children who has taken the time to attend meetings, research, and learn about the important issues and listen to hours of legislative committee testimonies, cancel culture, fact-checking, and censoring. That is the act of censoring or silencing a person or organization close to the truth, or censoring a board me member for a hot mic moment while sitting on a offensive and inappropriate curriculum. Anti-vaxxer, a well-read, resourceful person who makes educated decisions based on research and personal experience on when and what to safely put in their body. Jab, an experimental mRNA gene therapy disguised as a vaccination. Greenwich Public Schools, non-medical professionals who have not taken a medical oath and are pushing an experimental unapproved vaccine at times with misleading and inaccurate information. Facts. These facts come from the, uh, the vaccination FDA documents. There is no FDA approved vaccine. It is your choice to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Emergency use authorization is given when certain criteria are met, including there are no adequate approved and available alternatives. The COVID-19 vaccines are unapproved vaccines that may I say may prevent COVID-19. There is no FDA approved vaccine to prevent COVID-19. Pfizer and biotech are new mRNA technologies never used in vaccines before. Have the mRNA COVID vaccines been used before? No, both are still in clinical trials. Clinical trials, if when you research them, you'll learn we're done with healthy individuals. Moderna, did, is in the process of clinical trials. 15,400 individuals 18 years of age and older have received at least one dose. Pfizer, 20,000 individuals 16 years of age and older have received at least one dose. What are the benefits of the mRNA vaccines? According to Pfizer and Moderna, after stating that these vaccines are unapproved and may prevent COVID-19, both toward the end of their respective FDA documents state again that both are in ongoing clinical trials and then lie that Pfizer has been shown to prevent COVID-19 following two doses given three weeks apart. Both state that the duration 
um, and Moderna lies saying that they're shown to prevent COVID-19, both state that the duration of protection against COVID-19 is currently unknown. What are the risks? They list the non-serious risks. According to VAERS, as of April 9th, 2,602 deaths, 5,074 hospitalizations, 10,000. That, that's time. Thank, thank you very much. If you want, you can email your comments to the board. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next speaker, Megan Galetta. Megan, if you could raise your hand, it makes it easy to find you. Thank you. You are unmuted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Megan Galetta um, from Riverside. Um, you need any more information? Nope, that's good. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Um, thanks for having me speak tonight. I'm the parent of four children, ages 23 to 15, who have all, all gone through the Greenwich Public Schools. In the spirit of the letter that Andrew Gutman, New York City parent of a Brearley student, um, we, the parents of the Greenwich community, object to the following. We object to mandating masks for our kids in school and in all activities. There is an abundance of factual evidence from the medical community that have written about the negative health impacts of mask wearing, not to mention what it is doing, so, what it is doing socially, emotionally, and mentally to our children. We object to the Greenwich Public Schools inserting their way in between parents and students. This includes emailing the students directly without copying the parents. And this has happened a few times this past year and we feel that it is unacceptable and it must, be, and it must stop. We object to the explicit and inappropriate content and curriculum being offered to our children. It is completely unacceptable. There are things that we've heard that I cannot even mouth the words of, of or repeat or recall what has been shared with our kids and it's an atrocity and it must stop. We object to the, we demand that our kids be in school five days in person, no excuses. We have enough empty office buildings around this town that are completely empty and unused. We challenge you to figure it out. That is why we voted you all on the board. And if you were all in a corporate America position, you would be tasked to figure it out or you'd be shown the door. We object to, man to, be, we object to mandating the COVID experimental gene therapy for, for the students and this should not exclude them from attending in-person school any activities, trips, events, and sports. We accept, expect that our curriculum not get watered down. We expect that testing and assessments continue to be offered and that kids at all levels with all needs get the support they require. Board, our families have nominated you to your positions. These matters have nothing to do with politics, so please do your utmost to keep politics out of our schools our curricul and our curriculum. And when making decisions in these next critical months, as we plan for a full return, we ask you that you keep politics out of all of the decisions. It has nothing to do with it. It's not a left and it's not a right matter. The number one objective to, should be to see our children thrive, flourish in a healthy, supporting and challenging environment. This generation will be taking care and making decisions for all of us one day. And I ask you to urge yourself I urge you to ask yourselves from where you sit right now, can you confidently say that they are ready? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Natalia D. Natalie, if you could raise your hand, that makes it go a little bit quicker. Okay, I'm not seeing Natalie signed in. Uh, we'll go to our next speaker and we'll circle back. Uh, Sue Vigilante. You need to unmute, please. Yep, we've got you, we just need you to unmute. Aaron, I don't know what's going on. I asked her to unmute as well. So maybe it's um, user error. 
All right. Why don't we go to our next speaker and we'll circle back to, uh, to Sue and hopefully that will work. All right, our next speaker is Amy Muth. I have unmuted an Amy. Is this the correct speaker? Yep. Hi, Amy. You can go Hello, ahead. Hello, this is Amy. How are you? Good. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Dr. Jones, Chairman Bernstein, members of the Board of Ed, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak this evening. And a big congratulations to all of the distinguished teachers, especially our beloved uh, Jen Dunn. At the end of the last BOE meeting, some board members expressed the need to further explore why Dr. Jones had administrators read White Fragility last summer. At the time, I thought it was odd, particularly in relation to the conversation about racism and discrimination in our schools and the need for greater diversity, equity, and inclusion curriculum. I mean, many corporations in this country and worldwide are attaching DEI goals to performance appraisals, are investing in cultural awareness and diversity training, and are providing books like White Fragility and CAST to their employees and leaders in order to guide their management practices. So I asked myself, why is GPS any different? But as the month wore on, there were even more things of concern. The politics around how to fund the renovations at North Mianus, a school my fifth grader will likely never step foot in again. Then there was my family's own struggle to obtain an education for, mid for my middle schooler, largely around IEP violations, PPT drama, including ignoring professional recommendations, which caused me to think about what the GPS litigation numbers really mean in relation to special ed. As a parent, I see how much money I have had to spend on legal fees for my ch child to receive four homebound instruction hours a week, a violation of the 10 hour minimum and how GPS strategically makes parents continue to fight regardless of the laws and regulations. While we're often told during the BOE meetings that we never know who's moving here in relation to outplacement numbers, I wonder how this data is really examined. Do we look at how students and families could have been treated and provided services in a way that may not have required outplacement? Even more importantly, what is the price for students losing time? Time they will never get back due to power struggles, administrators bullying parents and broken PPT promises. But I suppose that's the benefit of the BOE having endless town council. And here we come full circle this week with the article in Wednesday's Greenwich Times, strategically positioned under Chauvin found guilty. Who decides the curriculum for town schools? An article that again politicizes our education system. I'm curious as to how other di districts handle these same issues. How do you ignore that we are living in a world where racism and discrimination exist? How do we ignore the experience of all our students and staff? Why is this discussion political at all? Racism is part of our country's history, past and present. We should all be using critical thinking skills to examine the world around us. How do we not teach our children to consider their own biases and assumptions when interacting with those around them? It's irresponsible at best. Why wouldn't we want our children to be taught these skills in an environment that is supposed to be safe for learning by educators trained to teach? Who knows, maybe our children could be educated, enlightened, and aware enough to not be part of the problem. I am concerned that this current dialogue is distracting from the problems that our students and staff are really facing. This dialogue is preventing meaningful change to occur and has allowed our most vulnerable population, our children, particularly those with special needs and differences to be left behind, often bullied and discriminated against. I implore the BOE members to stay focused on the role of the BOE as a policy-driven board following the policies of That's state fine. law. Please leave the politics out of thank our you. education system. Thank you very much. If you'd like to email your comments to the board, please feel free to do so. All right, we're going to circle back for the uh, people that we didn't get earlier. Uh, Gary Lasuski. Gary, if you're with us, could you raise your hand? All right, and I didn't see him on the list. Um, Natalie D. I did not see Natalie either. I just wanted to circle back and see. All right, and then let's try Sue Vigilante again. I know Sue, we had an issue with uh, you being able to unmute. So let's see if we can elevate them again. Um, Sue, I don't know if you've signed in under a different name, if you could raise your hand. I think we're just having technical difficulties. Um, all right, well, hopefully they, uh, they can reach out to the board via email and that is the end of the uh, speakers that signed up for public comment. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, next up, we're going to move to our monthly report, starting with the superintendent. Dr. Jones, take it away. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Just a couple of items tonight. Um, first of all, we have been practicing and getting ready for the NGSS. Um, just as a reminder for state assessments in Connecticut, we will be giving the NGSS and SBAC this year. And even our students who are fully remote will take those assessments from home. So we were working out uh, some kinks this week on how to do that for our remote students. And they held a session last night um, to help parents and know how to navigate that system. I also just want to congratulate our distinguished teachers um, and congratulations to all of them as well as Tom Healy on his announcement as middle school principal of the year for the PTA. Um, I want to mention, which I know PTEC did as well, that there will be a community forum next Thursday at 630 uh, hosted by PTEC and the League of Women Voters. And this is to share information about our facilities master plan and uh, how those priorities were set, how the process uh, worked, how we plan for the budget um, each year and how those are put together. We also have a lot of um, end of the year activities that are being planned right now. So we ask um, PTA and all of our parents to stay patient for another week or two uh, as we look at how we are going to do things like moving up ceremonies for fifth grade, for sixth grade. Uh, we are looking at um, being a little bit more open towards the end of the year than we were last year on things like field day and how can we do that um, and still keep some of our mitigation strategies or keep our mitigation strategies in place. Um, and I do just want to mention that on our call this week with the Connecticut Department of Health, their approach for school is different than what the governor did announce this week for business. So as of May 19th, most of the, most of the business aspect is being um, completely opened up. The Connecticut Department of Health is telling us that we should stick uh, with our mitigation strategies in our school, that they have worked for the school year, um, and that it's important that we continue that and we'll continue to take guidance uh, from Connecticut Department of Health, local Department of Health, head of nursing and, and our doctor consultant. But um, I just want to share, there's a little bit of, um, a, I'm not going to say a disagreement, but the approach for school and the approach for business right now is very different. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. All right, next up is reports of, oh, Karen Kowalski with your hand up. Yeah, hi, Peter. I just, I wanted to just have um, this opportunity to ask, talk to a, a couple of things that were mentioned in comments that um, with, and address them with, um, with Dr. Jones. So uh, Dr. Jones, and I've seen the emails too, but why is the administration sending out emails encouraging the vaccination of, of students? So I, I think it's through the lens of, of the holder. Um, I don't feel like we're um, coming from a lens of trying to uh, convince anybody to do anything. We're putting out the information for the families. And I do think we have an obligation to do that, even from the state of Connecticut. Um, you know, even in the Alliance districts, they were hosting uh, the clinic specifically for schools. And there is an expectation that, you know, schools are going to put the information out there. And ultimately, it's the family choice. Families have to decide what's right for their child and, and their family. So putting aside whether or not we agree that there's an obligation, why is it going directly to the students? If you, if there's an expectation that information should be shared uh, with our GPS community, why is it going to the, to the students? Why isn't it not just going to the parents? It went to the parents and it went to the students because our students who are um, 18 and seniors may have a different decision personally than their parents want them. And um, if they're 18, that's, that's a decision that the family has to work out again uh, with the students. And I will say student government had asked um, this school year that we do email students because um, a lot of the parents may not read their emails. They may not know what's happening. And so I have occasionally this school year, not very often. Um, I think we probably sent probably three maybe just to put general information out so that the students feel well informed. And again, that came from student government and it was a request. Yeah, I understand. I, I understand the general information regarding, you know, what with specifics for schools and what schedules on and cohorts and obviously what's going on in school activities. But I, I challenge the fact that there was a request to uh, disseminate medical information and medical 
uh, uh, advice or recommendations to to children directly. And I think yeah. that the administration, I th I'm not done yet. I think the administration should be very careful in um, what type of information is shared is, is given to children with respect to vaccinations and medical issues. That is a personal, that is a family issue that is there between the parent and the family. And I don't think it is the appropriate at all for the administration to be stepping into that conversation in, in any respect. Um, this, it's not required. Um, I, I'd like to know what the obligation is because certainly it's not required by the state or the federal government to get the vaccination. So there is plenty of TV commercials and radio commercials all out there on uh, with respect to the vaccination and it's out there. I do not think it is the administration's role or obligation to step into and in between families regarding whether or not a child should receive a vaccination. I think it's highly inappropriate. And I, re I respect that that's your opinion, but again, it is a family decision. 16 and 17 year olds cannot get vaccinated without their parents signing uh, consent. It is, so it ultimately is the parent's um, decision. And what we have put out were all of the links from the CDC, from the Connecticut Department of Health. Um, people can read as much as they want um, and they take the information, but we are not, uh, we've made it very clear. It's a family choice, um, but they're not going to advertise for instance, the clinic that they uh, put together just for Greenwich High School so that our students could register if they wanted to a little bit easier. We have to push that information out or our students and families would not know. How do you know that? Because we get the information from uh, actual Brunswick and Greenwich Hospital, and that was set up specifically for Greenwich Public Schools. And so that's that's how we communicate with our families, and it is via email. Um, and again, there's not it's not an opinion; it's giving families and students information for them to make that decision as a family. Look, I would I, that I would agree. That's yeah. Um, I, 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 I would stop the back and forth. It, it really is inappropriate to be addressed in the comments that were made earlier. Uh, I would suggest you and Dr. Jones take the conversation offline. All right. Next up, Mr. Sher. Yeah, uh, Tony. I I didn't know if I was going to speak on this, but I got a little more concerned the more I just heard can you just give me give me a a couple a, a clarifications i didn't understand what you were saying when you were saying we have an obligation to disseminate information could could you just i mean i've got a couple follow-up questions i'm just trying to get clear here what your thinking was in 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 doing this so before this what, becomes a lengthy back and forth, um, I, I would just advise that board members should be taking these conversations offline with Dr. Jones. Well, uh, I'll, I'll let you answer. You know, Peter, I, I, I respectfully disagree. If this is a public meeting, this is when we operate as a board, and this is when the public has this. I'm not going to go do these conversations. Well, that, that's with that you want to have the conversation for the public, but this well, is she's, here, look, she's here to present yeah, a report. You could be asking for that offline and not wait for a meeting to do that. Okay. Um, Tony, can you just elaborate on this when you say these uh, obligation to disseminate? I'm a little bit, um, I, I don't understand that. When we get information from the Connecticut Department of Health, CDC, any of those organizations, we have all year long about COVID information, push that out. And it's not to push out information to have an opinion one way or the other. It's to help parents and families be informed, be well informed. And that's it. Okay. So, so there's no, there's no, I'm not sorry, when you said obligation, it, it's just that I got it. It's a decision that you've made. Okay. The other thing I didn't understand is when you said, to we have seniors over 18. Yes, I know we have seniors over 18. They're adults in our school system. Why did we then send it to people who are 18 and under? Why did we do that? Well, as I said before, we sent it to the high school students so that they would know if they're 16 or 17, what's actually happening, what, what the information is to help them be educated as well. Um, and again, our young people had to ask for us um, to communicate more with them. And I think you heard one of the students actually reference it in their comment tonight. Um, yeah. It's just having the information so that they can be well informed and have conversations with their parents uh, and also sending it to the families. And, and Tony, I, I read the communication that 
my daughter got. And look, I, I'm vaccinated. So, and my wife is vaccinated and other people are vaccinated in my home. And I know there are people who feel very strongly that this vaccine, these so-called vaccines are, you know, everybody's making their own decisions. That's, you know, I don't want to get in a debate about vaccines. Um, what I'm what I'm a little bit confused by is um, I was going to ask you separately about the communication where it said that the vaccines are FDA approved and they're not. So, um, but I, I was wondering if, uh, and then somebody brought it up. So I wasn't going to bring it up until it was brought up here. Um, you realize there's a difference between those two things, right? Being FDA approved and having an emergency use authorization, yes? Mr. Schur, yes, I do understand the difference. Okay. Uh, and we have put out all of the links and the information for anybody that wants to read all of that information from the Connecticut Department of Health, from the CDC, it is all there. And um, there's the, the very first communication had several links. So if you went and you clicked on all of those, you could find out yeah. all the yeah. types of information. But no, I, I, I read the note, I read the note with your signature, Ralph's signature and the nurse's signature. And I noticed that right away way that it had a misstatement in it and you know it's misstatements happen I, I was just wondering I just wanted to get clear on where you were with this and if you maybe recognize that as something that should not be communicated in the future my, my last question is Tony is um, based upon these kind of questions and feedback do you, are, what's your intent are you you Will you continue to send things directly to students or would you going forward um, modify your practice and not do that? I think you were specifically asking about the vaccine and I think we've passed that point in time. Uh, the clinic has come and gone and it's just gonna be a matter of families now uh, signing up if they want to sign up. We're not gonna have any more of those. But as far as emailing students, just general information, I think I would honor that request by our high school students. And absolutely, if it's information just could be end of year activities, it could be anything. So yeah, I guess I don't have a problem with that, Tony. I just, my feedback to you would be, I. This is about medicine. This is about a medical decision. And I'm a, I'm, I'll just say it, I'm a little troubled that I'm, I'm not hearing um, recognition of that, that that's something different. We're not talking about after school activities and we're not talking about end of year things. I mean, this is, this is pretty, I mean, I hate to say it, but I mean, we're here. Uh, the school well, system the school system inserted itself between students and parents and i just don't think that was a good idea it was unwise and i i just wish somebody would say hey we recognize that as wise we've learned from this we're not going to do that again and i i guess I, i'm 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 not i'm not hearing that and um I, i'm hearing you say and, and i want to be fair to you I'm hearing you say this is a difference of opinion, and your opinion is we should be doing this. And I, I just, I'm, 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 I'll say it, I'm really troubled by that because I don't think you asked me long ago why superintendents don't last in Greenwich. And hold on. This is wait completely a, inappropriate at this point. Well, no, no, hold on. If, it, if it's related me, to this, Peter, topic, Peter. Look, I realize I think, you don't I like this conversation. We need to finish enough. it. We have off. a full agenda, Mr. Chair, and I think we've let this go on long enough. So I'm going to call on the next speaker, Ms. Stowe. Um, so, Tony, I was lucky enough to be with the uh, students at the um, at the XCON meeting, the high school students. And first of all, all the emails I've read, you've been very clear this is a family choice. I'm only halfway through my vaccination because I'd like to point out to people that I'm so young that I was in that group of people that couldn't get vaccinated to the last group. Um, but uh, I know that a lot of the kids were asking for that at that meeting. So, but you've been very clear in all the emails I've read that it's family choice and it is. Um, but more importantly, what they raised in that meeting and that they mentioned tonight that I wanted to ask you about to see if you've thought about it all 
is the seniors coming back together for at least a week. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Is that a dream? Is that possible? I just think that would be amazing for these kids. Um, we, I am working on uh, that right now, but not necessarily where the other students would have to stay home, um, but bringing seniors back because right now in a senior class of 700, we're only talking about 350 students that are at home. So that's where we are as of today. And um, we're trying to also um, couple some of the return with a uh, testing type program um, at the high school, the optional parents would have to, you know, sign, but just to help people feel that much safer um, about returning. So we're, I'm working on that right now. Okay, that, that would be a wonderful thing to sort of yeah. finish out those kids years. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Kelly. Well, I'm going to go we'll go back to the vaccine topic because it does seem a little controversial. Uh, but my questions are uh, a little more procedural. The uh, uh, the state aren't they providing us any guidance on how to communicate with our families? Because uh, we're not the only school district uh, that is going through this, where we have to communicate with our students and parents uh, regarding vaccines. It, it's it's we're on unique times. Uh, this has never happened before, so we have to figure out how to navigate it going forward. And I'm sure we're not going to do everything right, but certainly I, I would ask that, are we hedging our decisions by making sure that other districts and the state is guiding us in this way, Tony? The state actually does send us the information. That's where almost everything that we send out comes from the Connecticut Department of Health. That's why you know, I even wanted to point out tonight that their viewpoint on mitigation strategies is very different than what the governor announced this week. And we, you know, lean on them for how we communicate, what we communicate, um, trying to be as accurate as possible. And I will say, you know, I have, I've had as many emails um, sent or strongly so that believe the immunization should be mandatory. It is a very controversial topic. Um, and I've just tried to reiterate each family must approach it um, from what they believe is best for their family. But it's obviously uh, sensitive to many, and I could feel their pain. Uh, I, and certainly want to uh, make sure that we're getting further information just uh, other than making the decisions ourselves. And if we are, then we're going to make that statement that we're making it ourselves. So basically, if we're going to the state, discussing with them, uh, talking to other districts, uh, this, uh, trying to figure out how they're communicating uh, with their students uh, and, their, and their parents and their families, uh, certainly we want to re remain consistent with that. Uh, and if we feel it's wrong what the other group is doing, certainly we need to talk about that. So I agree. Uh, some of the things that were mentioned, I know we're not supposed to reference those things, but I, I kind of feel it's it, it's topic now. Uh, certainly we want to put a stop to any coaches uh, that were mentioned that are uh, are uh, putting pressure on, uh, on any student to do something that their family is deciding is not the right thing to do or or any teacher or anybody. So uh, uh, certainly we'll, we'll check through, the, we, I would suggest we check through the ranks to make sure uh, the families are not being misinformed uh, by members of the staff and that they're, uh, they, they're reminded that th these things are optional and uh, th these things are, are decisions made by guidance given to us by a, uh, uh, by a higher authority. Thank you. Yes, and we will absolutely um, address that with the director of athletics. Um, that's, I took that note down as well. Right. Thank you. Ms. Kowalski, I'm going to skip over you because there's some people who haven't spoken yet. Ms. Hirsch? Sorry, Peter, I didn't actually mean to raise my hand. I got trigger, trigger happy. <laughs> no worries. Ms. Hirsch? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, uh, I, most of, you know, I, I think actually uh, Mr. Kelly uh, spoke to pretty much what I was going to, uh, to say about getting a uh, Guidance from the state on this. Um, I, I know that we have received a lot. I'm, you know, the representative for uh, the board rep or liaison on CES. I know that they've been sharing a lot of this information within all of their districts as well as, as the other um, reps on that committee have shared with us as well. Um, and um, I, I was just going to say, our job uh, as a, as a public school district is to share educational information and, and educate people. And um, at least the emails that I've received uh, in regards to this as a high school parent have all uh, provided uh, educational information and it's all specifically stated that it is a personal choice, but um, we are offering the opportunity for students who may not otherwise have an opportunity uh, should they want, should they or their families want to get these? Um, and uh, it is a personal choice, certainly. And, uh, and I think that's been made very clear in every email that I've received or my students have received. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, to thank Dr. Jones for just at, at least uh, making sure to educate others um, and sharing all the, the educational links. All right. 
and just before we we move on, I just want to note, I, I don't think I seen any evidence that coaches have said this so obviously you're going to look into it which i think is the the right course but as of right now you know it's just a rumor so we'll, we'll wait to hear back from you on, on that dr jones all right miss olson um yeah I just, i'll be brief as well i just want to say um you know thank you because i i appreciate it dr jones that you and your team have sent out ample information um to families and it, it has been very clear that you know it's a family decision um and you know, with this, I do think that, uh, you know, more information and accurate information is better. And, and you've provided that to families. So appreciate that. And thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to move on now to our reports of officers, committees, and liaisons. So if there's anybody that's got a report, please raise your hand. Give you guys a moment. All right. Mr. Kelly. Oh, thank you. Well, let's talk first about the, uh, uh, Cardinal Stadium. We're having some great progress today. We had a bunch of cement mixers uh, driving into the site today, pouring lots and lots of concrete into those footings uh, that will someday in the very near future hold up those bleachers and hopefully last 70 years as the other bleachers have lasted. Uh, they're pouring a whole lot of concrete, deep holes, things are working positively on the stadium side of things. Uh, we have a bit of a hiccup up on the uh, uh, the ADA parking. Uh, uh, we ran into a bit of a challenge with the tree warden. We have some trees uh, that we tried very hard to uh, navigate around during during the design stage of the drainage and the uh, and the parking lot. Uh, and uh, there were some trees that kind of that, that the tree warden wants us to uh, address, preserve. Uh, we offered to possibly exchange other new trees uh, for those trees. Uh, we have a hearing on uh, May 12th at one o'clock uh, for all those interested in supporting the project. Uh, we'll get, get to discuss things with the uh, tree warden and, uh, and the people who are uh, in support of, of those specific trees and how we've tried to navigate and uh, design around those. Uh, but we'll have a discussion that if anybody would like to join and, and support our project on uh, May 12th, uh, we'll put out or contact me and I'll give you how you could participate in that uh, uh, tree warden hearing. Uh, also, we had uh, uh, some uh, uh, some nice uh, discussions as usual with Carol, uh, with Carol Sutton on the uh, negotiation committee uh, about how we can work together with our uh, our teachers and our unions, and it's always nice to have a, a casual conversation with Carol. She's a, she's been very nice and, uh, and opened about uh, about just uh, just things in general. Uh, we, a, a suggestion on a committee, uh, whether it's the appropriate time uh, not to speak of it, I, I'm just going to touch on it. Uh, we have the hillside waterfall, the waterfall in a corner of uh, of the uh, high school property. Uh, there's a committee being, I guess, informally structured, uh, supported by the Hillside Neighborhood Association. Uh, by the uh, uh, Greenwich uh, Sustainability Committee is supporting it, Greenwich Historical Society, uh, the Tree Conservatory, the Greenwich Green and Clean, uh, the Greenwich Green Escape Committee, all would like to support somehow beautifying and bringing it to, uh, uh, to attention to our community, this, this wonderful feature we have hidden by overgrowth uh, in the corner of, uh, of the high school. Uh, this is a project and uh, we have Ashley Cole who's helping us run this project. And uh, the uh, intentions are have this uh, project funded by outside uh, 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 funds, uh, not to be paid for by, uh, uh, by the town, but to collect uh, outside funds in order to make that, uh, uh, that waterfall nice. And hopefully we can work together with the town as well and create a committee that could possibly do that. Uh, so uh, we'll talk further on that. I just wanted to announce that tonight that we're, we're working on uh, organizing something like that. Well, back to the uh, stadium for a second. A few of the board members have visited the site. And I hope everybody enjoyed their visit, seeing the progress of a Cardinal Stadium. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Downey. Since we're talking about the high school, I'm gonna report in on the high school entryway. We've um, put out an RFP for architects. The committee is gonna be meeting tomorrow. And again, I think in a week or so, and we anticipate, I believe having an architect for selection, which we will present to the board, I believe at the May, board meeting. Um, and then once we hire the architect, we'll be able to go forward with the project. Okay, I'll make note of that entryway in May meeting. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Ms. Olson. Yes. Um, so DTAC obviously met this week and congratulations. It's already been said multiple times, but congratulations to 
um, to our distinguished teachers um, and also, and just thank you to Kathy Brunetti and the whole committee and um, all, the, all the work they've, they've done with it. Um, also, thank you, Tom Healy. Um, that's separate and apart from DTAC, but um, he's phenomenal, and absolutely deserves that award. Um, uh, Greenwich Alliance met this week also, um, continuing to do great work, um, continuing to celebrate AVID success. Um, for those of you, I think I mentioned before, AVID, AVID students, what it does is it helps AVID students um, in high school and college receive help with professional skill building, mentoring, coaching, and good money habits. Um, also, Greenwich Alliance is in the process of uh, reviewing all the, the reaching out grants that have been submitted, um, which are an amazing way for, you know, um, educators, and thank you to the educators that, that did put in for grants, because um, they, you know, they're a little lengthy to fill out, but, but well worth it and benefit our educators and ultimately um, the students. Um, uh, one last thing, tuning into music is, 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 is Finishing up end of April, um, it's been a huge success with one-on-one -on -one, uh, music lessons for, for 63 students who Skype, um, who would have not otherwise had music um, had, had music at this time. So um, thank you to the Greenwich Alliance for all they do and continue to do. Thank you. And just a, a quick share update on two things. Uh, one, while we will be back live uh, in person at our May meeting, uh, we still plan on uh, remote streaming, probably continue to use Zoom. Uh, and obviously, if there are board members or administrators that are not feeling comfortable attending in person, uh, it's a personal choice. Uh, next, just to let board members know, uh, we likely will have to schedule a special meeting from North Mayanis once we have more information about the project cost. Uh, the BET allocated money for the front end work that's already been happening, which is the removal of the uh, of the, the affected areas, uh, and we will have to be going back for a request for the actual repairs, uh, and then Dr. Jones will uh, will let us know if there's a, a plan hatched for uh, where the students will reside once the work uh, starts. So we'll probably take that up at some point in the future. So uh, just watch for an email on that once we have a better sense of the timing. With that, we're going to move on to our first discussion item, which is the AP European History Textbook, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Carabello. Well, thank you very much, and welcome. Uh, thank you for having us this evening. Lucy Areco will, with her team, will be presenting why they chose this particular new textbook for the AP European History course. Thank you, Anne. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lucy Areco. I'm the Bella House Administrator and the Social Studies Program Administrator. Uh, with me tonight are two of our amazing social studies teachers, Ian Tiedemann and Alyssa Stack. Um, both of them teach our AP uh, European history course and have reviewed um, a few books for consideration and we're here to uh, recommend that you adopt um, the, uh, the book uh, titled The History of Western Society Since 1300, um, a book that we've been referring to uh, McKay uh, for short. Um, I think uh, Alyssa was going to talk a little for, a little bit first about uh, last spring and um, you know, how we came to think about uh, looking at some of the books. And then um, Ian was going to uh, talk about how the books compare. Hi, good evening. So go ahead, Alyssa. Alyssa Stack. Uh, I've been teaching in the class for over 15 years. And when I first started teaching it, 15 years ago, the textbooks that we used were um, not brand new. So in those 15 years plus, um, they have been well-loved, well-worn, um, and it was time to look into some new options. Um, given the way that textbook usage has been going in the past couple of years, and particularly last spring with the distance learning environment, um, we decided that we really did need to take a look at um, some online textbooks and we researched a whole bunch. I'm going to let Ian Tiedemann talk about that process and how it was that we finally settled on the McKay textbook. Uh, thanks, Alyssa. Thanks, Lucy. Good evening, everybody. Um, 
So yeah, uh, we went through the process of looking at all of the different the different books. Can you hear me okay? okay. Yes. Great. Okay. We went through the process of looking at all the different books. That meant looking at their readability first, um, and they're all about they're all about equal. Um, the ones that we were using versus the the ones that we the one that we've put forward. Um, but what I think really differentiated the one that we put forward, the McKay textbook, um, was first, like we we're looking at a di different type of thing. It's not just like a book that we're giving students anymore. It's a full digital platform. And so amongst that digital platform, we have to look at the ease of use and navigation, the textbook tools that kids have, like the highlighting tools, the note card tools, and then of course, the quality of the learning resources included with it. Uh, that includes the different homework practice sets, and um, also the McKay book includes an entire entire secondary um, book, which is full of primary documents for students to use, um, as well as other resources that support teachers in planning lessons. Um, again, the McKay book had the easiest navigation tools, the easiest to look at. Um, it also had um, the highest quality learning resources that we felt for the students. So that's why we ended up putting this book forward. All right, any, uh, any discussion? All right, Mr. Sher with the fast hand. Go ahead, Karen, I'll go next. Oh, Peter, you hand up first. I know, I took it down. Okay, Karen, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, you know, I, I, you know, being on the uh, curriculum council and, and having reviewed other textbooks, uh, at least this year with math, um, I, you know, I know AP uh, curriculums and, and materials are, are handled slightly differently. Um, how often do you think that they tend to reviews, review and revise their curriculum and how often does that tend to necessitate needing a new textbook? Do you know? Well, um, Alyssa, you've been teaching Europe longer than me. Um, uh, how many times have they actually reviewed the AP Euro? When was the last time that they revised the curriculum? So I started teaching the class in 2004. And um, since then, they have gone through one massive curriculum review when they changed the, uh, the curriculum focus and also the structure of the test. I will say before and after that curriculum review, we continue to use the Palmer textbook and the Kagan textbook. Those are two um, you know, outstanding textbooks in the field. And um, there wasn't a need to change the textbook because there wasn't there weren't any supplementary materials that were directly aligned with the AP curriculum. Um, now there are supplementary materials aligned with the AP curriculum, but because it is an online platform, um, I think we'd have to go back to the publisher. But I imagine that in order to stay current, the publisher would have to um, reissue their AP materials um, if the curriculum ever changed again. But like I said, it's only changed once in the past uh, 17 years. And that was to better align with what college professors were saying. Students needed to know in terms of skills going into college, not in terms of the course overview. It has always been the renaissance to the present um, as long as I've been teaching the class. Uh, um, and then oh, sorry, another, oh, sorry. another thing that, another thing that, that we notice is that the books themselves have also been kind of overhauled and even some simplification of the order of the chapters. So the ones that we were using versus the one that we're putting forward has actually streamlined things into um, a much more, much easier to navigate book itself. Um, oh, so then the other question I was going to ask um, is, you know, I know you mentioned um, all the supplementary materials for students and teachers and making it easier for lesson, lesson planning. Um, you know, is there any support for students? Um, I know, especially in this past year, uh, College Board was trying to put together materials to help students uh, have, have added uh, materials for at home. Um, does this textbook include some additional materials and work for students to be able to I didn't hear those last few words you said. I didn't know if this textbook uh, and the online component also included any materials for students to be able to go back through a, a lesson at home or any other materials, supplemental materials for them specifically. I mean, uh, I, I saw that it had some, but. 
Yes, um, it has the ability that for students to actually create their own flashcards as they as they write and save them. It has the ability for students to keep their own digital highlights and notes in the margins. It also has um, the secondary source reader I mentioned. Um, it has embedded practice questions, and um, when the students actually um, read each of the homework assignments has an adaptive um, multiple choice test that they have to do. And as they are doing those questions, uh, they're able to go back to the text to get hints about, and, and, and it holds them accountable for reading and supports their reading with those, with those tests. And for the teacher resources themselves, those are things that we can then directly use or not use, depending on how we, how we, want, how we select that material with the students. Thank you. Lucy, do you want to talk about the College Board and their um, advisement to you and anybody else who teaches AP courses? I can say that I had to um, renew my certification to teach the AP course this year. Every, I think it's every five years a teacher has to put forward a syllabus to um, be granted um, you know, certification by the AP Board to teach the course. And when I put together my syllabus this year, I indicated this in the K textbook and um, our syllabus was approved. My syllabus was approved for this particular textbook. Okay, Ms. Downey. Um, two super quick questions about how many students a year take AP Euro. I'm just kind of curious, that's a curiosity and then I'll have a different question. So, oh, go ahead, Lucy. <laughs> um, in in recent years, we have roughly fifty students okay. take the course. Great. Um, and, and just I want to ask Dr. Jones in terms of the cost of this new textbook: is it covered in the budget that we voted on, or what's the impact of this? Just to know. That's more of the Dr. Carabillo question. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is covered in our current budget moving forward. Great, thank you. Mr. Scherer. Peter, Peter you're, you're mute. Hi, uh, Lucy, Ian, and Alyssa. It's nice to talk with you guys again. Um, <laughs> Alyssa, I was just actually trying to text uh, Audrey to ask her, her thoughts about this textbook because you did a marvelous job teaching her this course. Um, I had a, just a couple questions, uh, just a, a confirmation. Um, this, were, this seems to be really straightforward if I'm not wrong and correct me if I'm wrong because the college board sets the curriculum. It's not something set by Greenwich Public Schools. Um, and the textbook manufacturers are just, there's enough of a market for it. So they just aligned completely the materials, right? That's so I, I saw your, I read your, uh, the write up that you sent to the board about this. Um, and I gleaned out of it what Ian was talking about, which is, um, you know, you were really making the selection based upon supplemental tools, the fact that it's online. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, was there anything in the content between the three books you looked at that was different, or is it really not very different because the um, the the curriculum is so tightly prescribed and so tightly aligned? Obviously, to the you know this on some level is uh, unfortunately teaching to the test as much as you guys don't teach to the test, which thank you very much for doing that. I realize that's the reality related to this area. Is there anything in the content that's different between the three you considered or well, we, not really? We actually considered four books. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I saw, I saw three on that list. Thank you for the correction, yeah. four. We, we actually considered four. Three of them, Kagan, McKay, and Spielvogel, are mm -hmm. pretty similar. Yeah. They have a similar textbook look and feel. Palmer is very is very different. It has its own kind of like a very different writing style. Okay. And, and yeah, so in choosing one textbook, we went with the one that was like a more traditional textbook with a visual format that mm -hmm. that with with 
review questions and 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 some of the AP curriculums language um, that we went that direction and then we chose the one that that we felt most comfortable with overall. Yeah. Um, two two other or one question and then one ask. Um, just just a curiosity. When did this go through the uh, curriculum committee, the district's curriculum committee? This must have gone through a while ago, right? It was an assessment because I saw the rubric and the rest of it. People who scored it. Who who scored it? Who was on the committee that selected this thing? I'm sure it went through the curriculum committee at some point, right? So it was. Uh, we had textbook samples that we sent to uh, various parents and students. It was not um, I see. Okay. a specific designated committee. Okay, okay. Don't worry, it's not a problem, Lucy. I realize I, I can see the look on your face from that question. Don't worry about it. It's something we're gonna talk about as a board in a, in a few minutes. Um, the other question is, uh, how can I, and maybe other board members are interested before we take up the vote. Is there available, can you make available to us or I'm interested in taking a look at the um, book you're proposing? Is there a online copy or something? Can you guys figure that out? So we can look at it? I, I don't know about an online copy. I know- Or that, if you have a hard copy, that's okay too. Yes, yes. I contacted yeah. our rep because um, you know, I wanted to have the ease of paper if necessary, um, and she was willing to send out um, a hard copy. So um, I'm sure if we contacted her again and asked to, you know, okay. have a hard copy provided, that would be. Yeah, or if you guys have one and you want us, you know, if somebody wants to see it and they need to come by the high school or whatever you guys figure out, I, I don't want to make it hard. I would like to be able to look at it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the information and thank you for your detailed report. You're welcome. I, I was gonna make a joke about how much has European history changed, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that to Ian. Uh, but I, I do think the board has a limited role in the AP courses because of the, uh, the mandate from, from the folks at the college board. So I'm, you know, I'm sure there's information that can be shared with us on that. Um, Mr. Kelly. Hello, my question's a little broad and maybe uh, uh, just curious about the, uh, uh, the training, uh, whether the uh, supplier uh, offers a degree of training, maybe can further or elaborate on how uh, the staff, the teachers will be trained on how to, uh, how to uh, present this, uh, this, uh, this new textbook uh, or the, uh, the district supplies training for this. How, how, how do we envision the training to, to, uh, to be described that a little bit to me, please? Well, we, we, we learned to use it this year, actually, because we had the approval to do a trial run with the book. Um, coming into this year, given the, the, the 25 plus year old condition of the previous textbooks, one, uh, Mr. Bernstein was rushed to press right after the Soviet Union collapsed. So um, yeah, so it was time. It was time for a new book. And given the issue with getting books back after um, COVID, <laughs> Uh, COVID lockdown, you know, we figured, look, these books are, they can't get damaged, they can't get lost, they can't get germed up. And, and anyway, so we, we went through the different publishers, and we were ready to kind of, you know, use the other books again, uh, this year with the difficulties of distributing them and then recollecting them. But this publisher actually offered us a completely free trial run this year. And we've learned it, you know, as you learn to use anything through trial and error, but they've been very helpful. Um, being willing to offer us, you know, tutorials whenever we had questions, and we emailed them, and and, and the customer service rep worked with us whenever we had it. But mo mostly, the best way to learn to use anything is to is to just use it. Thank you. All right. So this is a uh, a first time. Uh, we will take this up for approval at our May meeting. Obviously, if you can get access for the board to take a peek, or if you get a hard copy, just. Uh, Dr. Jones can let us know how to view that. That would be great. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. We will move on to our next uh, discussion item, which is curriculum implementation. So Dr. Carabillo and Mr. D'Amico.
So thank you, uh, Mr. D'Amico and I, before we begin, would like to congratulate, congratulate our six distinguished teachers and Mr. Healy for his Connecticut PTA Award of Middle School Principal of the Year. So if you can put up the, thank you very much. So we are going to hopefully answer the questions that we have on the next slide. What is the GPS process for developing curricula? Where's the curriculum located for teacher access? Which board policies guide curricula development? Who monitors the safe and successful implementation of curriculum? And what curricula resources are available for parents? Next slide. So all of our curriculum work is guided and anchored in various board policies. Tonight, we'll be highlighting three of the policies that guard I work. They are policy 6140 curriculum, and you can read what that is. Policy 6161 about equipment, books, and materials, provision, and selection. And policy 6180, the evaluation of the instructional program. There are various additional policies that address aspects of the curriculum. Policy 6120, objectives and priorities of the instructional program. 6121, non-discrimination of the instructional program. Policy 6141, curriculum design and development. Policy 6142, basic instructional program. Policy 6146, grading assessment systems weighting grades, and policy 6161, equipment, books, materials, and provision selection. Next slide. Before we dive in, I think it's important that we review some of the terminology we'll be using tonight. First, everything we teach is grounded in standards, the written statements that outline specific skills and concepts that students must master by the end of the school year in each subject area and grade. From the standards, we create our curriculum, which is the what we teach and when or in which order we teach things. Mike, you can go ahead and click the... Uh... Instruction is the how we teach the curriculum. In the Greenwich Public Schools, we ground our curriculum in the Understanding by Design framework, and our instruction is based on the Gradual Release of Responsibility framework. The final term here is lesson plans, which are the day-to-day, hour-to-hour plans teachers create in response to and in alignment with GPS curriculum and instruction documents. At the bottom of the slide, you will note a reference to our management plan, which outlines our schedule for writing and updating our various curricula. Next slide. I thought it would be helpful just to have a snapshot of what you will find on the State Department of Education website. The state has provided a one-stop shop for accessing all educational standards that have been adopted by the State Board of Education. Once adopted, they are in statute to be used to design local curricula. By law, you have to design local curricula for teachers and students to access. Next slide. This year, the curriculum committee was comprised of two board of ed members, Mr. D'Amico and myself. Our sole focus was to look for a textbook series for K-8 math that was aligned with our Connecticut state standards based on the Common Core state standards with resource materials that would give us opportunities to meet the needs of every student and to assure all students are taught the guaranteed curriculum. This summer, we will be revising our curriculum to be in alignment with the grade level standards to match the linear progression of our new materials and resources. And we are hoping that you will be approving our request for our new text, Big Ideas. As you can see, we currently approach our committee a little differently and you just heard the difference that we have. 
our annual review cycle is designed to re-engage and support all of our diverse le learners, which continues. The makeup of our district curriculum committee used to be a group of teachers, parents, and administrators who met, I believe, monthly to discuss all different topic, topics, content, uh, materials, uh, applications, and to really see what was going on throughout the district. But what we found was that we were not able to really be specific about each content area and really dig into what needed to be done. So we decided to change it for this year with the changes that we had last year and this year with Mr. D'Amico and myself, it's given us an opportunity to really review what we have done. So this is our new way of starting to have everything be consistent and have a process that is followed throughout the district for K-12 curriculum development. Next slide. On this slide, you're gonna see an example of how we vet and select primary curriculum resources, such as the new K-8 math textbook. First, a determination is made that there's a need for a new or updated resource. Second, the program coordinator develops a budget that will cover the anticipated expenses associated with the purchase of the new materials, professional development that needs to take place, and to pay the committee members for their time in vetting the options. Third, a review committee is formed comprised of teachers, administrators, board of ed liaisons, and parents. Fourth, committee reviews the various programs and provides feedback using a district approved rubric that checks for alignment to current research on both content and instructional practices. Next, the committee solicits even more feedback. And finally, and it's the stage we're at this evening, the committee sends its final recommendation to the superintendent, who then presents the final textbook recommendation to the board for approval. Next slide. The role of curriculum is to provide the district with a roadmap to what is taught through a district written curriculum that provides intentional alignment between standards, instruction, and assessment. Curriculum alignment is an agreement of what is written, taught, and assessed. It is expected that all central administration, building administrators, and teachers be committed to the implementation of the standards-based written curriculum to support increased student learning and student success. The written curriculum is def defined by non-negotiable standards, objectives and expectations that students are to achieve while in school within a given year. As Mr. D'Amico said, the written curriculum is developed utilizing the understanding by design framework and is aligned to the Connecticut core standards, state frameworks, and approved national standards. The written curriculum is the framework that supports the development of the taught curriculum. The Board of Education officially approves the course objectives lined in the content-specific curriculum. The taught refers to instruction, the process by which teachers develop units of study, lesson plans, and approaches to instruction, utilizing the district-identified strategies and models utilizing the written curriculum. The main goal of the taught curriculum is to engage students in a rigorous standards-based curriculum, curriculum that provides multiple and varied opportunities for students to achieve the tenets of the vision of the graduate. The assessed curriculum is the testing of the taught curriculum. It is used to measure success and impact of the curriculum and student mastery of the standards. It measures how well students learn the taught curriculum. So on this slide, you see a summary of the changes that we made for this year, that it gave us an opportunity to examine our process and see what worked and what needed those improvements. We learned from our past that even though teachers did a lot of work during the summer, that one week, they were not able to complete all the revisions and were not able to completely enter the revised curriculum or the resources into Schoology. The curriculum work will be paced throughout the year and in the future and during the summer as needed, and it will be led by our coordinators. 
So our future goals are here, so you can see what we are working on now. Update and revise curricular units across all disciplines, K-12. Expectations will be followed, and we want to create exemplar lesson examples to illustrate how di digital tools and resources can be integrated within the curriculum. Next slide. The purpose of this slide is to share with the Board of Education and the public that's listening in tonight that teachers have access to all district created curriculum and materials. We have made a commitment to utilize a common district template in all content areas K through eight. The reason behind this decision is to guarantee consistency and to provide high quality instructional materials. Next slide. New this year. The pacing for all elementary core subject areas have been placed into one easy to read document since the K-5 teachers teach it all. What you see here is a snippet of the kindergarten pacing guide, but all K-5 pacing guides are now structured this way. Next slide. Mike, you can click on, thank you. Here you see an example of the curriculum and instruction documents that teachers have access to. The first excerpt shows a unit outline for the kindergarten humanities unit, my communities and me. The next excerpt shows how the teacher can implement the unit in his or her classroom. Hyperlinks to teaching and learning documents and resources are included throughout this portion of the curriculum. You will notice that teachers are provided some choice and which resources they use to ensure all students' needs and interests are met. However, teachers are expected to teach this unit in alignment with the standards and skills outlined in each dimension. Next slide. On this slide, you see how we monitor curriculum implementation. Our administrators are responsible for assuring the Greenwich Guaranteed Curriculum is being implemented by our Greenwich teachers. During our distance learning experiences, as well as in-person learning, administrators have visited classrooms to observe teachers and give constructive feedback to them. Last year and this year, the State Department of Education waived the summative evaluation of all teachers and administrators. Teachers will receive feedback this year from their evaluators, but will not be rated this year for the second year in a row. Next slide, please. This is the new tuple rubric that we finally completed this year and you will be getting it presented to you in June. We will be presenting the final revised tuple rubrics to you. And this is the domain that addresses the teacher's plan for implementing the guaranteed Greenwich curriculum, addressing the standards and engaging their students in inquiry and learning. Teachers are encouraged to use flexibility and creative creativity in determining the how of teaching the instruction, not the what of teaching. The curriculum expe expectations are outlined in district maps. Teachers plan instruction with district supported frameworks such as the workshop instructional model, inquiry and the tuple indicators. Before a formal observation, a conference is held between the administrator and the teacher to learn about the students in the class, what is going to be taught, determine where in this open sequence the lesson falls and the differentiation, the differentiation and tasks are well organized and how will the teacher know the students are meeting the learning tag, tar targets? Do the results of student assessments show that teachers are following the GPS written curriculum? And that's what we look for. Next slide. The parent curriculum guides. This is an example of all of the K-5 curriculum guides for parents that are on our district webpage. So if you click on teaching and learning on the welcome page, and then on the district curriculum on the district website, you will find them. These are not complete yet, but it is work that will continue to be completed over the next year and uploaded so we can continue to be partners in learning with our families. So let's review. What is the process for developing curriculum? 
the curriculum manage plan, management plan maps out the content, grades, and work to be done. I am currently working with the Greenwich, Public, Greenwich High School administrators to develop a 912 curriculum map. So all content and grade levels are consistent with the process of developing and revising curricula. Teachers and administrators and sometimes consultants work together to analyze the curriculum to determine if units need to be redesigned, evaluate textbooks and resources, and develop foundational lessons, develop scope and sequence documents, pacing charts, and design assessments. Number two, where is the curriculum treated located for teacher access. Originally, it was in the Aspen Curriculum Mapper. Some of the curriculum was migrated to Schoology and Google Drive. Currently, we are identifying the best location to centralize all curricula. But in the meantime, all curricula will be in Schoology. Number three, which board policies guide curricula development? Policy 6140 guides curriculum. Policy 6161 guides equipment and materials selection. And policy 6180 guides the evaluation of the instructional program. Who monitors the safe and successful implementation of curriculum? Building administrators serve as primary evaluators and monitor curriculum implementation by conducting formal and informal observations and walkthroughs to evaluate how closely a lesson's learning targets are aligned to district curriculum. Coordinators and program administrators serve as contributing evaluators to teacher observation as well. Number five, what curricula resources are available for parents? Currently, the K-5 parent curriculum guides in multiple disciplines are located in the district curriculum page on the GPS website. We are working towards completion of the K-8 parent curriculum guides. And that is our presentation. And if we are welcome to answer questions that you may have. Ms. Tony. Christina, you can unmute. Me? Yes, you. Yeah, it was just a little trouble hearing you. That's okay. And so the screen sharing still going on. Um, I just wanted to let um, our board mem our fellow board members know that when we saw this matter um, on the agenda, policy governance met um, and reviewed um, our th these policies relating to curriculum. We actually had a few extra in addition um, to what Ms. Carabello had. We kind of went through all the cave related policies that we've adopted just to be sure we felt they were comprehensive. Um, and we also looked to see, we didn't see that we're missing any CABE recommended policies on curriculum. Um, there's a couple of procedures um, that'll come up in the course of retirement um, as we'll talk about later uh, relating to those, but those will be implemented ultimately as regulations mm -hmm. by Dr. Jones. But I just wanted to kind of let people know that we had taken a look at this from a policy point of view. Thank you. Other discussion? Ms. Kowalski. So Christina, just following up, you said you had you looked at policies. There are other policies. Which ones are those? And then what was the discussion? Well, we basically just reviewed. Um, there was, I think, I'm just thinking if I, I th we also looked at 6141326, you know, kind of, we looked at all the ones that Dr. Carabello cited, plus a couple more, plus we were looking at procedures and also some of them tied into this retirement of procedures that we are tasked that we are doing. So we just looked at all of those as a comprehensive picture to feel that the policies were in place um, that covered the things they needed to cover. We looked at the CABE manual. We didn't see that we were lacking any um, because we also are looking at things that CABE has some, not on this issue, but um, recommended policies that we'll ultimately be bringing before the board if we decide they're warranted. Um, and then we did look at these from a procedural point of view because there are all these procedures um, in, in the old E-series that 
linked to these and some of them need to become regulations that accompany these new numbered policies. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I appreciate if you don't have it in front of you and, and we don't need to take up board time for it, but I'm sure you have a comprehensive list and maybe it's in your meeting yeah. minutes of all yeah. of the policies and procedures that you looked at. I'd just be curious as yeah, to see sure which ones that you looked at to make sure that we were we had um, a I'd comprehensive to, policy in place. That'd be I'd great, be I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so the, I guess going into the the process, it, look overall, and I appreciate Mark and, and Anne the the presentation because it it outlines a very comprehensive and thoughtful approach to how uh, curriculum is reviewed, approved, and is put forward before the teachers. So here's the the elephant in the room and the and the question I have so if we have this process in place um, and and given one of the comments earlier from one of our parents uh, saying it was a hundred percent that Tony had said it was a hundred percent legal to show that video so how do we prevent something like that happening again we have this um, these curriculum guidelines, we have a process, it's thorough, our policy committee has reviewed it saying we have all the right policies in place. So how do we prevent, um, you know, pornography being shown to second graders? Mark, before you go, Dr. Jones, did you want to address that comment since it was made about you? Yeah, absolutely. We do not support the use of a video of that nature whatsoever. Um, what does happen within curriculum and implementation um, is, is teachers do pull in additional resources and there is an expectation um, that they are going to use good professional judgment when they pull in those resources. Um, but absolutely, we, don't, we do not support uh, the use of that video uh, in our classroom at all. No, and I understand that. I mean, that's, that's the natural response to it. And that's the one that everyone expects to hear. But it, 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 it was shown and it was, and so that's why I had previously asked about, this was in a social emotional learning segment. And if we have curriculum for which the, ter the teachers can pull from that have approved materials, why wouldn't those have been utilized? The only thing that I can put that um, off to is that, again, we're dealing with people and we're dealing with humans and we have over a thousand teachers. We don't have these incidents happen every day. Um, and a teacher has to have good professional judgment about the materials um, that they share with children in developmentally being appropriate uh, for the age. And it should match the standard or the content that they're teaching to. Yeah, but we've had, I mean, putting aside this particular issue, we may not have them every day, but we've sure had them a lot lately. Um, and the second grade incident isn't the only one. There was an incident, with at least one at Western Middle School on three different occasions. A 10th grade class was shown and uh, was asked to read an article um, that may not have been, um, you know, pornography in photos, but it was certainly verbally uh, pornography. And I'm wondering how that gets into our classrooms on a regular basis and what's being done to prevent those types of articles, um, which are highly inappropriate. And, and for what purpose those are being taught, I, I have no idea. But how would that fall within this rubric of not coming into the classroom going for, forward? Um, again, it's, it's the high school issue that actually emerged last year. Um, but when that article was published, and uh, again, the district does not support uh, the use of, of what was in that article and that content, and we follow that up through human resources um, when something like that is brought to our attention. And I, you know, interesting enough, I, I was surprised when we discovered that it was actually utilized last year, right after it was published, that nobody brought it to us, a student or a parent. Um, I was surprised by that. Because again, the district agrees that that is not uh, that article was not an article that should have been utilized um, at Greenwich High School. And going back to the to the con the content at Western Middle School, even there, uh, I mean, how are we handling that component when, in fact, um, the, you know, I, I believe the principal there you know, wasn't going to shut that down. 
what I can say is that if a teacher is not teaching to the standards, we are following that up through HR. And I think it goes back to the presentation that you just saw um, that we expect teachers to teach to the curriculum, to teach the content um, that they are expected to teach. And certainly they do pull in other resources and it should be to support uh, the curriculum at hand and it should be a material that is age appropriate. And, um, and when that's brought to our attention, we, you know, if something that goes awry, which we don't want it to, uh, but if it does, we absolutely follow that up from a professional standpoint. So is there a, a, a way in which to provide more resources for teachers that are pre-approved that they can pull from? Because if, if teachers are con constantly thinking that they need to pull from YouTube, which I, I have no idea why they'd want to pull from YouTube, but if they're and if we have approved content, and I think you'd mentioned before in a conversation you and I'd had that there are approved videos for social emotional learning that are age appropriate, why wouldn't a teacher just take the resources that have already been pre-approved rather than going out and finding something else? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And obviously we wish that that, it, that had been the case. Uh, that what was provided had been utilized. But I will also say that I think Mark and Ann are very aggressively pulling this curriculum component together for Greenwich Public Schools because uh, it has been harder for teachers to know where to look to find resources when some of it was in Aspen, some of it was in Schoology. And, and they're working very aggressively, I think, to with their coordinators, their whole team, um, to be able to make sure that it's it's tightened up as far as helping teachers find resources with ease. And I do, I do think that, that that has been part of a challenge for us. Um, you heard the European history teachers talk about how old the books were um, that they were using. We know we're, we are adopting math books this year because we allowed those, those books to get nine and 10 years old. Um, and I think we, we are gonna have to make a commitment um, from staff perspective, and then also when we present the budget to the board to, to continue to invest in curriculum and resources. Um, foundations, I think you can hear loudly and clearly from a lot of parents and teachers that that has been a resource we've needed for a long time. So we are addressing it. I think um, trying to get as many materials, resources in the hands of teachers so that they don't feel like it, it is hard um, to know what's available. So that is something that we definitely are focused on. Yeah, but I think it goes a, a little bit more deeper than that in, in that you have um, your materials being pulled in. And if we look at the materials in, in Western Middle School and and the like, you, you have issues where you, know, you very charged political theories are being used in classes and that's not part of our curriculum. Absolutely, and whenever that's brought to our attention, we follow it up. Um, you know, the expectation is that teachers are teaching to our curriculum that they're um, they're they're not supposed to just be pulling in whatever they think is important. And, and in a matter of fact, even when we're teaching a controversial issue, and you you know you you look at the board policy on teaching controversial issues, it's really our job as an educator to allow those points of views to have discussion in the classroom and not be led uh, by the educator's point of view. No, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've read that policy and that policy particularly noted that um, it, it is supposed to teach all views and encourage a robust conversation on both sides so that students um, having various opinions can feel comfortable in having those conversations. Um, but I want to make sure I think that we need to give a hard look. And that's why, Christina, I wanted to look at those policies to see if we're if we think the policies in place with respect to how teachers are supposed to teach and encourage um, students, because the, the key element for uh, allowing for robust conversations is the fact that students should actually feel comfortable and teachers should make their students feel comfortable in a setting in which they can share their views. And I'm not sure that's happening either. Um, Ms. Stowe. Um, yeah. So, the, yeah, there is no doubt. I mean, we should just say it, all of us, the second grade video was awful. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I think that we also need to, Tony, I like what you said. I mean, we went through all of our policies. In fact, just, just so you know, just so everyone can see, oops, 
this is just half of the policies. Okay, so we've gone through all of them, um, but I think that you made a good point, Tony, is that um, we expect our teachers to be professional and that you can't really put a policy in for, um, but when they're not like in my, my you know, financial world, there have to be consequences. And it seems like there were, and um, I think that that's important and should be uh, noted. Um, I wanted to ask something specific to, to the presentation. Um, and it's really what the PTAC academic excellence rep said. I thought they had some really good points that I wanted to come back to. So I don't know, Anne, if this is to you or Mark, sorry, but um, the, we need consistency, no doubt, across our schools. And I think that is something we've heard ever since I've been on the board that that's not, unfortunately, there. And you know, how can we get comfortable that we are going to get there? And um, I know it's important that teachers, of course, have different styles and they'll present things differently, but I really want to hear, that's number one, a little bit more about how we're going to have consistency across the schools. And then secondly, I, we always say we need to be partners with our parents, but we really need to feel that. And um, I think that, you know, I want to know too more about what my, my students are learning because um, I want to help, right? I want to be supportive. I don't want to make the judgment on what the curriculum, you know, is for, for my third grader, my fifth grader, or my eighth grader. But I can tell you that the teachers, and there was a teacher tonight um, who was one of our distinctive teachers, and it doesn't surprise me that she was, because she tells the class at the beginning of every lesson what's going to be taught. And I can then actually have that conversation at the dinner table. And I know that's extra work, um, but it's awesome. And I just think if we can have more of that, uh, I know that I know I personally would be happier and I, I expect our parents would as well. So if we could just talk to those two pieces, that would be great. Yeah, Kathleen, if I could just uh, start with um, my hope. My hope is that the uh, math textbook review process that we've undergone this year um, is an example that uh, we're moving in a different direction. I think that the makeup of the committee, I think the input from our board liaisons, I think the valuable input from our staff and our parents have brought us to the point of a, where we're, we're presenting a, a, what we believe is a comprehensive program which addresses some of the needs of the past. To me, the Big Ideas program provides a singular primary resource for teachers to develop their lessons. It should eliminate the need or the, or the desire to look elsewhere for supporting materials because it's as comprehensive as it is. That said, no textbook is ever 100% aligned with the standards that we are trying to address. So it is the responsibility of the uh, content specific coordinator in conjunction with working in teachers in the field to provide those supplement, supplemental resources that are vetted before we put them in front of students. And I can also tell you that we are working very diligently with our administrators with the TEPL rubric to make sure that they, they are following it and pointing it out to the teachers. This is the first year that they have used the TEPL rubric with our teachers, so it's been new and it has different expectations. It has higher expectations for teachers to be consistent with the way they prepare their lessons, with the way they deliver their lessons, and the way they look at the data to make sure that those assessments are showing us that yes, indeed, they are using the appropriate materials and the curriculum to make sure that their students are getting what they need. So we're doing that work. Uh, we've learned a lot this year and Mark and I have really worked very closely together with our uh, coordinators and some of our lead teachers to make sure that we are supporting our teachers and guiding them to make those good professional choices if they do bring in anything that's not vetted by us at this point. We are really trying to make sure that we put processes in place for teachers to bring to their administrators materials that have not been uh, approved by the district 
to see, are these the appropriate materials to use? So we have a, a lot of questions that, and checklists that we're developing so that we can have teachers have access to that. So if they have a supplemental material, they can go through that checklist and say, yes, yes, no, oh, I better go see the principal and get some, some support from them and get their opinion. Kathleen, what I would also add to that, and, and, and to me, uh, this excites me greatly, and I think it's a positive step forward, is that we're reinstating our coordinators so that they span into the middle schools. I think this year that was a, a challenge for us. Uh, I'm excited about the fact that we will have that reach, and I'm equally as excited that we have decided to make the uh, we've decided to uh, split and have a math coordinator mm -hmm. and a science coordinator. To me, it makes all the difference in the world when you can have an expert in a particular field focus on the constant renewal of curriculum materials for teachers. Great. Helpful, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Peter, you're on mute again. I, I want to be constructive here, uh, but I have to tell you, this conversation is infuriating me. And the reason it's infuriating me is we've had, we have obviously had major system failures in the management of our curriculum. And I realized this thing just got slapped on the agenda because as the public doesn't know, but board members know and Tony Jones know, I sent out a note after we had these recent failures demanding that we discuss this right away as a board. Thank you for at least putting it on the agenda. But um, I'm, I'm really, really troubled. I'll say this and then I'll move on. I'm really, really troubled by this conversation from the administrators. Um, it, first of all, all of these things that you guys are talking about that we need and you're doing are things that all of you just undid that we long had in the, in the district and we never had this problem. Okay, we had full coordinators K-12. That was a very recent decision to reorganize them so that they didn't do that. We had a K-12 curriculum director. That decision was made in the last 12 months to eliminate that position, to redirect resources elsewhere on the recommendation of the superintendent. That was her decision to do that. Um, this, the way we manage curriculum and all the things you're talking about, this was completely 100% foreseeable. This is the reason, and I raised this issue and got nothing but an argument from the superintendent at the time, that this is why I was not voting for the 2021 budget, because we were stripping resources out of curriculum and curriculum management. We were fracturing the management of it at, in terms of leadership. And we were going to put our teachers in a very bad position. This has been a, a problem that is completely foreseeable. And we have the problem now. And what's most troubling with me about this is there is this undertone of blaming teachers for what happened. Teachers didn't use right judgment. I mean, I wrote down all these comments. It's shocking. No. The board and the top cabinet leadership created this situation, told our teachers to go out and get their own content as a procedure, and we knew about it, and it was 100% predictable what has occurred. And what's bothering me the most, and Mark, with all due respect, when you came into your job, you didn't even know what our procedures and policies were. I, you and I had a conversation about this, and I pointed you to these. 
but these were decisions that were very recently made and that we're paying a price for the decisions that are made. I'm not hearing the team stand up and say, ah, you know what? We're new to this. We made these decisions. We put the, ourselves in this position. We've now root caused it. We know how we got to the position of the recent events. We had four of these guys, four events, one in, the, one in elementary, one in the middle school, two in the high school, in the span of 30 days. I've served on the board 12 years. I can tell you, in the 12 years I've served, this has never happened before. We had a curriculum management system. It had its warts. It had its lack of implementation everywhere, but it worked. And it worked for 10, nearly 11 years that I've been serving on this board. The fact that we've had these problems is a completely brand new phenomenon. And I'm just really worried that the, the thread here isn't a self-reflection as an organization to realize we made a series, a series of decisions were made by everybody here. I didn't vote for it, but it doesn't matter. I'm a member of the board, so I'm accountable. And it's really bothering me that there aren't people who are just saying, stepping up and acknowledging. This was a screw up, it was predictable, it's based upon decisions that we made. We now need to take corrective action. I mean, I'm, I'm shocked, and then I'll get off my horse, to hear Tony Jones say, Peter, uh, could you address her as Dr. Jones or Tony? Tony, you don't need to say Tony Jones. Dr. We, Jones said, we need to invest in curriculum and people. Five months after we're cutting that department, cutting resources out of that department on our most recent development. Look. If I may, Mr. I, Bernstein, um, I, I do just wanna point out that when you talk about the high school issue, um, that happened under the old structure. It was last year. Uh, yes, it was utilized again at the beginning of this year. That was under the old structure. And I think that's one of the reasons we've really worked to try and restructure central office. And I feel like the team that we have now and the work that they are doing, I do believe we're going to be in a much better place uh, there than where we have been in the last few years where we stretched people trying to work across K-12. And if you even just look at the one position and what we ask of Sheila Saval to actually work kindergarten through 12th grade and to be over science, yeah. technology, yeah engineering and math, we have not cut a lead position at central office. Uh, Mr. D'Amico is now in that position. We did fill that position. So we- uh, I'm not gonna debate it. We took people, look, we he, took people- who were, let Dr. I, Jones Peter, I have the floor. Well, actually look, you basically asked a question. If there's not a question, look, you move on. To I'm gonna say, I'm gonna move off of this topic, but I cannot let these things that aren't true go unchallenged. Look. We took people who were curriculum coordinators, curriculum support people, it's in our budgets and, our, and they got redirected to other jobs. The Those one decisions were made. That we did cut was PE. Absolutely, I communicated that to the board. And our coaches that were out coaching, those are not, they were not part of the curriculum writing team necessarily at central office, but they are math interventionists. And the one thing that the board, including you, have asked me to do since the day I started here was to be as responsible as I could in bringing a budget that is within guidelines that will make sure that we can provide what we need for our children. And and at that point in time, math interventionists, and I still believe, uh, were a top priority in comparison to having those six, oh, five and six coaching positions. And that was a decision that I made. I own that decision, and I think it was the right one. And I think in the middle of COVID, had we not put in math interventionists, we probably would have been scrambling in the middle of this year, uh, trying, to, trying to do it in the middle of the year, because it was a real need that we had, um, and it is, it's a, it's a series of tough decision making, um, but I feel like we have the right team in central office and um, I think they're doing some great work. Mark, the question that I wanna ask is about your chart. Um, on your chart, you reference, um, if you could put up the chart. Which one, Peter? 
Uh, it, there's nothing on the screen share. I can't see it. So, yeah. Uh, back at number. Um, three, I think it's three. I can't read that. That's too small. Yeah. Terminology one. Yeah, you're you're referencing policy 63, 6141. I, I want to understand what you're in, what you think, uh, what you're saying in this. What's the implication of what you're saying in this um, paragraph that you're that you're uh, citing? Because I, I read it as textbooks shall be defined as supplemental references which shall not be considered textbooks. What what was your purpose in, in, in highlighting that? That's our policy, a board policy. So I, I don't know why you'd be asking. I, I know, I know, I know. Peter, they didn't cite the entire policy. They extracted a small part of the policy. And I wanted to understand from the administration why they did that and what they think that means. Why are they communicating that in this chart? Anne or Mark, I don't know who did this chart. Do you mean the textbook um, chart? It says right here, policy 6161, equipment, books, materials, provision, selection. Oh. You said tech, it says textbooks and electronic learning, and you've, you've underlined and bolded some things here. So I'm trying to understand what you're trying to communicate. So I, we, because we are um, just finished with our new K-8 textbook uh, presentation and looking at the various texts that we could use, we wanted to show that they are the primary or basic reading for students in a particular subject, such as um, math, mm -hmm. science, mm -hmm. AP courses, whatever they happen to be, okay. and um, student selection during the entire year. Supplemental and reference books are not considered to be textbooks. So I didn't want to have people think that when we get a reference book, say for the library or supplemental materials for the library media centers, they are not considered textbooks, but they are considered supplemental resources. Okay, because Ann, what I'm trying to understand is, is that um, the, what you've presented tonight in, in what I've read is a, a little bit of a change in the way that um, we have managed uh, curriculum and the board's involvement in curriculum in alignment to state statutes um, and the process that we've had for such a long time. And you seem to be, you guys seem to be proposing changes in the way we do that. And I'm, I'm trying to evaluate and understand those uh, changes. You know, like in our policy, as an example, 6161, there's a state statute that's critical in this area that is not referenced. Now you wouldn't know that. That's the responsibility of the policy governance committee and the board to know that. Um, but there's one really critical state statute that outlines obligations of the boards of education uh, that is missing in that. It also, uh, it says in some places that as a board we're required to review and approve uh, textbooks. And it also continues and says other instructional materials. Mm -hmm. When you ask the lawyers at the legislature what their legislative intent in that is, is they're pretty clear about that. What, what I think was important for board members that haven't been through this before or haven't served on the curriculum committee to understand is, is that there's a lot of areas where we delegate our responsibilities to the administrators. And then there's some areas where because of state statute, we can't really do that. We've kind of always pushed the limit in Greenwich on that and it's worked and served us really well. Um, we've delegated a lot of our legal responsibilities to administrators, prior superintendents, uh, prior directors of curriculum um, and it worked. As I said earlier, we've never really had a problem with that. But part of the reason that it worked is that the board always made clear, in addition to policy, uh, the board has always spoken with one voice about this, 
uh, we do not want a curriculum in Greenwich that is politicized in any way. I know other districts do that. It's a whole debate in the country, but we have always spoken as a board with one voice saying, we don't want that. And we've asked the superintendent to make sure that our curriculum never gets politicized, left or right, center, I don't care where. It's, 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 it's a unique cultural value that we have always, um, for decades, uh, honored in Greenwich and our administrators have helped us do that. The second thing that occurred is that, um, and Dr. Jones referred to this um, in controversial issues, we've always had the value that's very clear. We want our students to, to, to develop as thinkers and argue both sides of an argument and so on and so forth. But we've been very, very clear Anytime that in the curriculum, anything controversial is going to be put in the curriculum, both sides of any point of view on a particular topic must be presented. And that has always been honored, uh, not, not just one side. And the last thing that we've always done is we have relied on our director of curriculum to highlight and bring to the board proactively any part of the curriculum, and it was usually in uh, social studies or anything relating to science and health, to highlight to the board and bring forward for consultation anything that had the potential to be controversial so that the board could give guidance. It, it's helped because the board hasn't had to review math as an example. We can leave that in the hands of the administrators. Uh, traditionally, we've been able to leave English in the hands of the administrators or phys PE in the hands of the administrators because it's not areas of the curriculum where controversial topics or political points of view could really be introduced in a meaningful way. The, the, the problem that I think we've run into recently, this is my root cause of the analysis of this. We have broken down the system to honor those values and implementation. I don't know that happened in the transition to the superintendent, new people, reorganization, Mark getting his job. I don't know, could be 20 reasons. I'm, I'm not putting any value reason, but that happened. And the second thing that has kind of happened is um, we, it's clear to me we have not reinforced the teachers where the guardrails are and we put them in a horribly bad position. And there are some teachers who've been with us a really long time. They know the rules of the road. Um, they may not agree with them, but that's okay. They know the rules of the road and they're implementing it every day in their classroom. Then there are some others who it hasn't happened with fidelity. I think, and I'll end it on this point, and I'll let others speak, based on my experience with this, based on my work serving now on this committee and with you, and of course your predecessor, Irene, with Karen Hirsch and so on and so forth, um, I always do my homework. And I, I, I think the system has broken down and we need to go back to some basics. I think of what you've provided here might provide that framework, but I'm not comfortable that you guys have completely analyzed based on recent events, what the root cause is and how we prevent to miss uh, Kowalski's point of view how do we make sure this doesn't happen and we go back where we were, where we didn't have a controversy, we had no controversy. I mean, I'll, get, I'll give you one last example. I'm very concerned how it was mischaracterized what happened at Western Middle School. And it tells me that we haven't faced up to that. I mean, what happened at Western Middle School is, and you guys and board members, if you haven't seen it, go look at it. It was an English class Okay, think about that. It's an English class, not a social studies class. It's an English class. And the students were given the Macintosh survey, 
which you should all Google it and look it up if you haven't read it. It's a 40 question questionnaire to have a student evaluate their white privilege. It's called a white privilege checklist. That's its name, all right? Now, I'm not putting a value judgment on whether that's good or that's bad, but just like we had the conversation about, and I don't wanna to respond to Ms. Moose's question about it. I don't wanna politicize this. The point of it is, is that when that gets introduced into an English class, it's not honoring all those different things that we have long honored in the system, a de depoliticized curriculum, multiple points of view. It, it just didn't get implemented that way. And what troubled me is that we got two different answers about that. We got one answer that said it was a rogue teacher. And we got a different answer 24 hours later, which it was part of a curriculum that had been going on for a while. I don't know what's the answer. I don't want to have an investigation into the answer, but it's those kinds of inconsistencies that are not okay. So we got to get back to basics. We, I applaud putting resources back that were stripped out. I was very vocal about that was going to lead to a problem. It was not going to support our teachers. I support you guys in that 100%, but we've got a little bit more work to do to recognize what has transpired and not sweep it under the rug, but face it openly and uh, realize some serious failures happened. And we need to make the corrections going forward so that they never happen again. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I've got. You're muted, Peter. Sorry. Uh, thank you for telling me that because I'm here, sitting here talking to myself. I, I actually have a very different view of the history. I, I've been on the board for eight years and, and quite frankly, uh, I wouldn't be surprised and I, I'm sure Mr. Uh, D'Amico won't say it, but what he probably found was not a, uh, a complete set of documents to start from. Um, you know, we, uh, we did not start in a good place. We have not been in a good place in curriculum for a while, but it's not about the the, the extra materials, it really is overall the curriculum. Uh, and, and that leads us to the place where we don't have supplemental materials in some spots. But the, the department wasn't cut, it was realigned in a way that actually makes a lot more sense to me in terms of, of separating it out by the levels and having continuity as it all flows through uh, Dr. Carabillo. And, and I think that we're, you know, we're going to see the, the fruit of that. The, uh, the, the two goals that you've set that were on your, uh, your PowerPoint, I think are the right ones, your future goals, right? Updating the curriculum so it aligns and actually works and, and making sure you've got the, uh, the exemplars that uh, the teachers can rely on. Um, but we, you know, our, our, in terms of our investment in curriculum, they used to do the Summer Curriculum Institute. They didn't get through all the work. And then they basically were foisting new curriculum on teachers right before school started. It was never a good model. So I think moving away from that is actually a very good thing and, and you can be a lot more thoughtful in, in the work you're doing. And I think that'll let you fill in the holes. We have cut curriculum as a board to make our budget numbers. We've done that. We warned the BET about it. We warned the RTM about it. We talked openly about it at our meetings. I, I think that that is something that we, we need to fight for because if our curriculum isn't in the right place and the materials that are needed to execute that curriculum are in the right place, we're never gonna have consistency across the district. Uh, we're never going to move the needle and we're going to find ourselves, you know, kind of always running from behind. You know, when we, when we talk about these, uh, these, these issues though, um, you know, we have a policy. We have plenty of policies. We, we don't lack for policies. I think some of this is about making sure our teachers know our policies and know the expectations of them. And, and I think if we want them to exercise good professional judgment, we'll continue to communicate. And I know Dr. Jones has done some communicating about that. We've had that conversation offline. You know, in terms of what we learned from this is we can do better in terms of making materials available. We can do better in terms of making sure they know where to go if they have a question. You know, I've heard people describe these materials pornography. Look, I, I watched the video, okay? There is a, a portion of, of kids that that video is appropriate for. It was not appropriate for second grade. I think we can all agree on that. But pornography, you know, uh, Justice Potter Stewart said obscenity is, uh, he knows it when he sees it. I, I don't think that that's pornography. And I think referring to it that way is, 
it is a unfair characterization of what it is. It was inappropriate for those students. That, that is not pornography. Look, teachers need to be responsible, right? They need to be responsible for age and subject of pervert materials. They need to have an outlet to go to if they are lacking those materials or if they find something they want to use, but they're not sure about it. Um, they have to be able to exercise some judgment uh, to teach difficult topics. We, we know we have that, right? We had an election uh, last November that was heated and the country was heated about it. Uh, are we talking that civics classes can't have a discussion about that election? I don't think so. Are we talking about, uh, uh, about making certain topics off limits? No, that's, that's not what we need to be doing. But we do need to make sure that, uh, that our teachers are equipped to be able to talk about those things in a fair and balanced way. And, and to do that, it requires communicating with them. And I think that that is what Dr. Jones and, and Mr. D'Amico and Dr. Carabilla are talking about. Communicating with the teachers, making resources available, and, and basically ensuring that they're carried out in a certain way. And that's what the evaluation process is for. You know, when I when I come to this, I just I think of two questions really. You know, what did we learn from this and, and what did we do to correct it and prevent it from happening again? I'm, I'm hearing movement in the right direction. I think that, uh, you know, it's not, the sky is not falling. We have 900 teachers. They're doing amazing work with our students. Things happen. Um, I, I'm actually quite curious to hear from Ms. Olson because she's the only teacher on the board, right? We're not in the classroom. We have, we have theories about what we want to see in here. Uh, Mr. Sher, I can see you on the phone, so you might want to turn your camera off. Um, we, we have theories about it, but quite honestly, you know, our role is, is set in a certain way. Um, I, I will close with this. I have always been frustrated with when you go and look at the policies and you look at the state statute about curriculum, you know, what the board's role is. All of this work used to happen in the summer about changing and moving curriculum around and it never came back to the board. And I think that that's something that we should have a conversation about. But we are not the, uh, we are not the thought police. We should not be handpicking materials used in classrooms, suggesting books. That's not our role. So let's make sure we understand what our role is and that we execute it well. With that, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Uh, I will challenge you on something though for a second. I think that uh, if you believe that coaches are not teachers, uh, then you've never had a good coach. Uh, I have worked, I think I'm the only one here on the board who has actually worked for the Greenwich School District. And I worked for a decade. Uh, I wanna go over some personal experiences because I appreciate the observations of uh, policy and looking down on this, this instance. Let me start with uh, the uh, video that was shown to the second grade was outrageous. Uh, it, it, it Disturbing, it should not have been shown to those children. Uh, we have to find out what went wrong, of course. And I, I, I love the, per the perception or the aspect of, of looking at it from the top down. Uh, you remember me a little bit, and let me go into my time working with the, uh, uh, with, uh, the Greenwich School District. Uh, as a coach, uh, at, uh, at one point, 150 kids every day, six days a week. Well, six days, not seven days a week, for two hours a day, uh, were put under my charge. Now, I had five coaches working for me. Those five coaches were being supervised by me to make sure they were behaving appropriately. I gave them a practice plan. Uh, they had to do a lot of work on their own uh, to figure out what to teach the kids. But I monitored those coaches and made sure uh, an example of a, of a misbehaving coach might be a coach yelling at, at a child. Uh, I would take that the coach aside, I'd reprimand that coach and tell him not to yell at the uh, students anymore. Uh, that's not the appropriate way to get the message across. Something that might escalate is a, a coach using foul language uh, uh, towards the students. I would then bring that up. I might have to bring the athletic director into the discussion. We might have to meet the three of us, the coach, the athletic director, and myself, and talk about what that coach should not be doing uh, as far as uh, his behavior. Uh, the, uh, uh, if something more serious happens uh, and we have to go to the athletic director and the athletic director believes it's a further problem, we might have to go to the uh, school principal, high school principal, and we'll discuss the issue. Uh, we'll handle it accordingly. Uh, now, what we did, uh, or I did in my experience of 10 years of doing this, we had situations which we handled sometimes at my level, sometimes at the athletic director's level, and sometimes at the principal's level. Uh, I believe that's the structure that should be in place uh, and uh, that worked for us. Uh, it, it's, I know it's different th than the schools, uh, but also too, we, uh, we, uh, than the, uh, than the uh, classrooms, uh, but we also were teaching kids in the same manner and making sure that the, uh, uh, the coaches were accountable for their behavior. I was accountable, the athletic director made sure of that, 
and the athletic director was accountable by the, uh, by the principal of the, of the high school. Uh, we oftentimes would have to go to, the, to YouTube uh, to get drills. Uh, we would be responsible enough to go over those videos in advance uh, before we gave them to the kids. But there was a lot of, uh, there was not a lot of guidance other than you will run a rugby program and you will teach the kids. There's an interview process in order to bring a coach, a head coach aboard. He's responsible for the coaches working for him. Uh, a lot of questions were asked. The interview process was thorough and, uh, uh, and good people were hired. But mistakes can happen along the way. But what you want to do is take those mistakes and learn from those mistakes and make sure that that structure or a good structure is in place to address those. Now, if a coach had used a, a foul language uh, during the course of a practice and uh, is the superintendent responsible for that coach using foul language, well, you know what? The athletic director is going to hear that from either the kid complaining or the uh, a parent complaining because the kid might bring that home to the parent. So checks and balances took place in the structure that I had. Now, I guess, Mark and Ann, uh, the questions I have are my experience working 10 years with the district, do we have a structure that is in place, checks and balances, where if an, a situation that happened to the second grade, their direct superior immediately identifies that and then brings that to the next level? And if it's not in place, are we changing anything to make sure this stuff does not happen going forward? Joe, absolutely. The, the process that you just outlined is exactly what we do in the schools. So as a former principal, one of the things I would always encourage my teachers to do is be risk takers and innovators. But I was also very clear with them that if they were going to try something new for the very first time, it needed to go across my desk first. This way I could be sure that I'm putting a set of eyes on it with the level of experience that I have to make sure that what they're doing is appropriate. They also do that within their teams. They do it with the supportive instructional coaches or the assistant principal, but certainly, um, I think one thing that you touched upon uh, that's very similar in schools as to coaching is that it's the responsibility of the building administrators to actively engage in conversations with teachers and visit their classrooms. The best way to inspect what you expect is to be out and about in the rooms. Well, that's good. I'm glad that's in place. That certainly makes me feel more comfortable because these things have to be addressed and stopped. I know that also, too, as a coach, in order to keep the attention uh, of, of young students, uh, you sometimes had to get a little, um, I guess, uh, edgy. You had to get something to get their attention. You had to make sure that you didn't just go on plain, boring topics. You sometimes uh, stepped into topics that might be somewhat controversial just to get their uh, uh, attention, something that I guess Mr. Bernstein made a reference to the uh, political environment uh, uh, some time ago where maybe you wanted to work on discourse discourse amongst the students and try to go over that topic between push-ups and uh, passing drills and just to try to get their attention because a good coach takes those opportunities where those kids are paying attention to teach them. And, uh, and we would do that. And, and if it did get to the point where it did get back to my superior, and it's amazing, I do have to give a compliment to our athletic department. There were ears everywhere. If something was a little bit controversial at times, uh, I get uh, uh, athletic director Lindine stopping me in the hallway saying, Joe, did something happen along the way? And we shared that conversation. So the structure is good there. And I hope uh, that structure that I know that my experience with the, that decade of working with the schools, uh, I hope that is the same. I'm glad you said what you said. And you, uh, you have the same uh, structure in, in, in your, uh, uh, your, your uh, charge. Absolutely. And Mark and I also meet with the administrators regularly, both of us, to make sure that we are listening to them, that we are hearing if there are any challenges within the building, if there are any things that they are hearing that they need our support from. And also the work on our TEPL committee, our teaching and learning uh, committee, has done a lot of work on our domains that I will be sharing with you at the end of the year that really focus on what is happening in the classroom and having principals be in the classroom and assistant principals being in the classroom, being more visible, making sure that they are looking for that information and that data that teachers are following that guaranteed curriculum. And if they need support that we can support them as soon as possible. 
Well, thank you. And one last comment will be that I know uh, that if one of my coaches had stepped out of line and did something inappropriate, certainly uh, uh, we'll just say hypothetically in the same category as the uh, second grade video, uh, I'd certainly make sure that that, uh, that coach was uh, uh, disciplined accordingly. And I trust that uh, uh, that uh, the seeing the superiors to that uh, uh, the teacher in many of the examples that were made, the few examples that were made today, uh, hopefully they'll be addressed uh, properly and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, making sure that that doesn't happen again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hirsch. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Carabello and uh, Mr. D'Amico for the presentation this evening. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, a lot of thought went into that. Um, I, and I know instead of talking about uh, some of the specifics that were within that, um, we've veered into other areas. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, while mistakes were certainly made and it is not for me to opine uh, on something that is a staffing issue, you know, I, I it does certainly bring up for us, which is why policy governance has gone through all of our uh, curriculum uh, policies, you know, uh, ways to look to improve and, and make positive changes. And I, and I do see that these positive changes are certainly starting to be made. Um, you know, I point to the fact that we, we do have a policy on academic freedom. Um, teachers are certainly uh, able to, to select uh, some of their own materials and, and methods of instruction. Um, and that was one of the questions I sort of, uh, I had a quick question on, um, as our teachers are certainly allowed to, to, to um, have some add-ons uh, for them, and I know you're working towards building a better library of those materials for our teachers. Um, how often are our curricular and ancillary, ancillary good, good Lord, I can't speak this evening, uh, materials kind of reviewed? Um, you know, I, I know our students are certainly asked to, uh, to look at those materials and critically analyze uh, the material, and our teachers really work with um, the subject matter to, to help our students really delve into them. Um, which really does make a difference when, when we're reading things in, a, in isolation. It's hard to it's hard to know how they're being utilized in the classroom. But obviously, some of the materials that we've seen recently uh, may not have been the most appropriate to have shared with our students. <laughs> um, you know, at the middle and high school level, certainly. Um, so, I, and definitely in the second grade level. But I just was wondering how often those materials are, are reviewed. Karen, I can tell you what it needs to be and what the focus is moving forward, which is, in my opinion, curriculum needs to be reviewed throughout the course of each school year and certainly more comprehensively in the summer. Uh, I believe Mr. Bernstein had mentioned um, the, the past model was to bring teachers in to work with coordinators over the summer. And yes, we will continue to do that this summer. However, I'm reevaluating that because there could be a, a, a much better way for us to provide curriculum to teachers. There are agencies that we can partner with that have curriculum writing teams, specialists in each field that could do the work probably more efficiently and effectively. Uh, you know, we ask a lot of our teachers to give up some of their summer to try and get six weeks of work in three weeks or two weeks. That's a lot to ask, and you can certainly then expect fractures in, in what we're able to produce. Um, you know, I think it's a very fair statement to say that inconsistencies erode public trust. My goal is to eliminate as many inconsistencies as we can, both in terms of curriculum practices that are in current place, and then also in terms of the materials that are available to teachers. And Karen, to your point, one of the selling points for Schoology was that when teachers engage in the platform, they have the ability to provide feedback on the lessons that have been given to them, whether it was a successful one, uh, whether it missed the mark, whether they were able to modify it and share it so that all of the teachers across the, the district could uh, engage in that constant process of reflection. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, you know, it, it, it definitely is. Um, you, you sort of um, put forward something that I, I find uh, very interesting when you're talking about ways to provide uh, better materials. Like, I, you know, our, our teachers are certainly working overtime this year, um, having to take the lessons that they are teaching and figure out new ways to deliver those, uh, 
both in a hybrid model uh, versus you know remotely as well as for in-class students. And, and I certainly know how hard that must be. I'm not a teacher, um, but uh, I grew up with one. Um, so I know how hard they work. Um, and so my question to you um, again would be, you know, I, I know that we're, re go we're going through everything and vetting them. And, and um, I know we're putting up, I've been asking for years to make sure that uh, um, curriculum standards are being shared with parents so that they can support their students at home. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, as a parent uh, at Glenville, um, our teachers, every time a new unit was uh, being introduced to our students, the teachers would send that information home to parents um, and send sort of information as to what the students were sort of looking at. Is, you know, is that still being done? I know it also happened uh, when I was at Western, it's still happening for me um, at the high school level uh, in many of the classes. Um, is that still happening um, at the elementaries and middles? Karen, I can tell you in many areas it's happening, but I can't tell you with certainty that it's consistent. And again, if it's good for one school or a series of schools, it should be a commonplace in all of our schools. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, that was something that I had recommended ages ago, and I still think would be great for, for every subject matter. You know, we, teachers have those emails that they send out, and it could be a great resource if they are able to share uh, that so teachers don't have to start from scratch every time information that they share with parents. But um, because I, I think that's sort of critical, then the more, the more we know and can support our educators, uh, the more they can support our students. Um, and I guess the last, so that leads me to my last question. I know you talked about when K-8 um, curriculum and standards uh, and disciplines were gonna be sh hopefully available for parents to review. Um, and I'll ask Dr. Carabillo, is there, are there any plans to be able to do that uh, at the high school level as well? Um, as I'm sure parents might want to know. I know we, we've spent a lot of time talking about K-8. That's something that we have started a conversation about. We have so many different courses. I think it would be difficult, but we are talking about it and seeing if we can come up with some kind of format that may be very helpful so that parents know what is going on. Um, I know I've had conversations with the program administrators about how do teachers inform um, their students and their parents about what is expected in those courses. So it's something that I want to make sure is consistent across every course at the high school. So that's work that we are starting now. Well, thank you. I will say a, a huge thank you to both of you because consistency is certainly key across classrooms, across buildings, and across, um, you know, from, from grade to grade. So I really appreciate that you guys are doing the, the hard work um, and starting to make sure that there is that consistency. Um, I know parents uh, have always been concerned when they speak to friends with students in other schools that things are being taught in different, uh, poetry might be taught in one school, but ahead of other literature, um, but students all get the same within the same year. I think having that opportunity for parents to see what's being taught throughout the whole year uh, will be very helpful. So I, I appreciate that you guys are doing that hard work. Thank you. And, and Mark, I just want to let you know, I think I heard Barbara O'Neill cheer from across town when you said you would look externally for curriculum and materials. It, it's something that the board talked about for years and never seemed to get any traction. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that as well. But I know Barbara's cheering. So thank you. All right, Miss Olson. Thank you. Um, I know I wasn't even going to raise my hand. I, I really agreed a lot with what Mr. Mr. Bernstein's comments sort of for me hit the nail on the head. And he's like, I want to hear from a teacher. I'm like, fine, I'll raise my hand. But um, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I do have some things to say, but I first just before I before I forget, you know, talking about getting um, curriculum, you know, getting get well, the funding was cut right for some of our professional development and now we're talking about getting some you know really working through curriculum and i just want to put it out there too that uh greenwich alliance you know th they say like we're here to help let us know how we can help um in certain areas if that's something I'd, i want to remind us to sometimes tap into that because the greenwich alliance is looking for ways to 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 help our educators with curriculum with morale with whatever so um just to put that out there um, in terms of the, the recent events, I guess, if you want to call it that, or, um, you know, obviously it doesn't need to be said again. The video was not appropriate for second grade, the, the writing not appropriate for 10th grade. I mean, I mean, the reading from what I saw, um, of the article, not appropriate for 10th grade lesson. Those, those aside, um, you know, I, I really do believe that, you know, teachers need to be allowed to have a certain level of 
professionalism and also, as was said, academic freedom. And those two combine the professionalism with the academic freedom with the support you know, and work as a team. You know, teachers don't create curriculum. Curriculum should never be created just in a bubble right? It's, it's, it's collaborative. It's always teamwork. And curriculum should never be completed. There's no such thing as here's my scope and sequence. I'm done now. There's no such thing. It's an ongoing process. Like it never ends. It's not like, what's your curriculum for this year? Well, you know, I'm sure you know this now, like you're still figuring out like what exactly, are we, what is the most, you know, important, valuable material that we need to get through this year? And how are we going to deliver that? So there's, there's so many parts to it. It's sort of a complicated thing, but it's never done in a vacuum and it's never completed. Um, and, you know, as was said earlier, it's always a growth process. It's something that you, you look at, you, you fine tune, and every single scope and sequence I've ever said always says work in progress. It should be a work in progress. So you should never stop working on it, you know. Um, and I think the teamwork, the support, the, the, um, the support from the administrators, um, you know, the, the, the visibility, but also knowing like, like you had said, you know, Mr. D'Amico, when you were a principal, having an open door policy, having not just feeling like administrators are always in their classrooms as teachers, but also that teachers can walk into the administrator and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking. What, you know, what do you think about this? Um, in terms of like, in terms of YouTube, uh, it was mentioned like who would use YouTube and then, um, you know, um, I've used YouTube. It's just important to preview. You know, I mean, there's a lot of valuable catchy, catchy songs on there, or different, different things that, that I use to teach, you know, gra grammatical points or vocabulary or verb conjugations like YouTube is, I, we have a whole list of, of YouTube videos on our, on our website, you know, um, on, on a page where, where, a place where I teach, like, as long as they're approved, as long as they're previewed, YouTube can be a valuable tool. It's something that students connect with, actually. So that, that's, that's not, that's not a bad tool. Uh, it just needs to obviously be, be vetted and previewed. Um, I don't know what else I was going to say. I, I, that might be that might be the gist of it. Um, you know, I think it's just important that I think it's just important that also context, right? So, you know, Kathleen mentioned that you know one of the distinguished teachers always said, "Here's my objective. Here's my goal. Here's what I'm going to teach." That should be every, every teacher should be saying, "Here's my goal. Here's my here's here's my objective. Here, the students will be able to X, Y, and Z by the end of this lesson." You know, and when that's out there and that's clearly communicated, then the, then the, you know, parents know what the students are going to learn. The students know what the students are going to learn, you know, whether that's sent out in, a, in an email or a newsletter or whole, whatever that looks like, as long as we're communicating what our goal is, what our objective is, whether it's dialogue and, you know, an interactive dialogue, sometimes it is going to fall around an election year or something around politics. Sometimes it is going to be a hot topic, but what is the context? Like I, I, you know, um, there's the, if we just take random samplings that say we can't give this particular survey or we can't teach this particular thing without knowing the context, um, that's a different story. Again, I'm not talking about those couple of outliers. I'm just saying, generally speaking, like there's always context, um, and and I think I think that needs to be, um, uh, you know, people need to keep that in mind as well. Um, but. So I don't know. That's that's what I got. Um, uh, you said as a teacher's perspective, but. Um, I, I also just say that I, I do, I do, I really do trust in this process. I, I think that, you know, having, I think that I do see teamwork between the K to six, you know, the, the, you know, K five, six to, to the high school versus elementary middle, um, seeing you two work together. And um, there's a big difference from K through 12, right? So, so having it broken up by, by both of you um, does seem to make sense to me. And I do sort of trust in the structure um, of this. So. Um, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Sher. And then let's try to wrap it up because we still have multiple other agenda items. Peter, you're muted. Mark, I didn't understand something you said in response to uh, Ms. Hirsch. Um, we were talking about Schoology and access to information. I, I didn't understand that. I mean, I've been on the board when the superintendent came to us and said, we need $500,000 to buy a content management system for curriculum. They came in and they asked for it and they wanted it and it was a learning management system and we authorized the money and they got it. They then spent seven years mapping curriculums to clean all this up. Um, Schoology was never meant to be the repository for 
um, curriculum. I don't, I don't know how that happened. Schoology was meant to be supporting communications between st a parent, a student and teacher. It was supposed to be the place that the students could access the curriculum. And it was supposed to be the place that the students could communicate and, and uh, work with the teacher. I'm not really sure how those two systems got mixed up like that because we spent millions of dollars on these things. So, and, and I'm also interested to say when someone's out there storing curriculum in Google Drive, I mean, board members have IDs on Aspen for looking at curriculum. Uh, it's a curriculum repository. So I, I wasn't clear what you were talking about when you were saying it all got mixed up and the tools don't work. and and then you reference the tools in maybe a way I guess I hadn't expected. I also understood part of the reason when the administration at that time uh, presented Schoology is one of their selling points. You could go back and look at the documents they presented in the archive on the board. They presented it as that will be the place that parents can also see what their kids are working in, what's coming, what's in the class. And the, the issue, of course, is always infidelity of implementation by a teacher. If a teacher puts that information out there in a really rich way for the student and for and parents can see it, they can really plug in and support. If it's out there in a haphazard way, then they can't. But you know, I didn't understand what you were talking about when you said tools and that. Can you can you clarify that? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure I use the word tools, Peter, but what when you go into Schoology, you know, you have the opportunity to set up a course a class, right. a group, right. or resources. Right. What I was referring to is the resource section where teachers go to identify instructional materials. And there's a communication thread in there where teachers can leave comments for other teachers after their experience in using a particular lesson. Correct. That, that, that's, that's what I was referring to. But they're also but, using, they're, the, the curriculum repository for the district is Aspen. Aspen, Aspen Live is our curriculum mapper. Yeah, and it's the Peter, place where it has in it the curriculum map, right. the scope you're and seat. Is that, is that right? I mean, I'm just trying to understand if I was hearing something different. Schoology has a, 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 a vast amount of our curriculum stored in it. Now, it you, mentioned, you mentioned something very accurate. There are teachers that have shared Google Drives where their information is living in more than one location. And that's a challenge and it's a concern because as we said, curriculum is constantly updated and refreshed. And if you have it living in multiple places, you might not always remember to go to all of those places to make those changes. We really need to get to a place where we have one curriculum management platform where teachers can confidently upload any materials that they may have and where our coordinators can download the materials that we're creating for our teachers. Okay, so that's good. I, I'd, I'd like to get an update when you guys figure out exactly how you're gonna re-implement that with these systems to do that. Um, my, my second question was, I mean, we've always had this debate in the board. I, I never was comfortable with this sidebar curriculum institutes in the summer. I just chose not to completely fight that battle because, you know, <laughs> there were there was a majority of the board who would, you know, fawn at 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 superintendents who wanted to do that. But it was predictable what's happening. When you're writing your own curriculum and you're using norm regular classroom teachers, who by the way are paid over the summer. It's not like they're coming in and volunteering their time. It's extra work they get paid to do in addition to their normal annual salary. And they chose to come in and do it. And, and I got a lot of feedback. Teachers like doing it. So it was, you know, but we had this situation where we're always rolling our own instead of buying uh, um, fully integrated packages from professional curriculum and content developers. Um, it's not surprising we kind of, in my book, you kind of wind up in these kinds of places where it's slow to do curriculum, so on and so forth, despite everybody working hard. Is your intent, I, I heard you kind of say, 
I want to go from having that done internally to having it done outsourcing. What is your thought about just not doing that anymore and actually buying off the shelf and modifying from there? Buying from textbook manufacturers because there's a plethora of them. There's an explosion of content available. So it's something we're going to explore, Peter. Um, one of the things that I will mention, um, and, and you talked about this, there are teachers that absolutely uh, enjoy coming in and doing the curriculum work over the summer. And the, the, there is a perspective that um, when you have the teachers within the district writing or revising the curriculum, mm -hmm. that you get more immediate buy-in by their um, colleagues mm -hmm. because they were invested in the work. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that, that's one, that's one consideration. Upside, but, right? Yeah. But the other, the other consideration, and, and it's something I really want to aggressively explore, but it's going to have financial implications is just exactly what is the price tag if we wanted to, I don't know, for, let, let, let's say it was um, social studies. It was elementary social studies and we wanted to completely overhaul and repackage the social studies curriculum, but we wanted it to be done professionally by an outside vendor. I don't know what that would cost, and that would certainly have implications when we put forth our, our budget for next year. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, and let me ask, this is my last question. Um, structurally, I think you know this, and you know, it's gonna sound gorpy to other people. Uh, Megan, as a teacher, may not have even been aware of this. Um, longstanding practice in the district, which was a source of huge exposure, and it came home to roost in the worst way. I know people want to put nice words around it, like recent events and what have you. Um, you know, th that's kind of like, uh, for me, perfuming the pig. I call it what it is. Um, the, the situation um, is we put our teachers in a place where, you know, those three bubbles you laid out, where we were essentially asking teachers, we were truncating what was coming out of central office in terms of curriculum. And we were asking teachers to go get additional content in their individual lesson plans. That was a, a philosophy in the curriculum department it really exposed teachers because they're out having to get content. My question is, have you given recent events? Have you and Anne already essentially put out new guidance in a memorandum to teachers, essentially banning that practice or putting more guard guidelines around that? Because I, I think a lot of this happened because we told teachers, I mean, the administrators told teachers, in some cases, you got to go get your own content. I mean, look at what happened to 10th grade. It was an English assignment. And it was a, uh, it was an assignment, which is called out as a very specific thing in Connecticut State Department of Education curriculum guidelines. It's called out in our policies as a very specific thing. The teacher decided to pull down an article uh, about toxic masculinity, which is a particularly loaded subject, and decided to create a, a, an assignment, presumably in support of a unit around that. Now that was incredibly bad judgment by that teacher. I don't even know who that teacher is. But at the same time, I mean, to lay that off completely on the teacher it, it, it is not okay because I know, you know as well as I do, that teacher wasn't off doing it. That was done over a summer. They prepared it as an assignment. I'm sure there are other people at the high school who knew that that was prepared. It was done in more than one class. This idea that it was like this teacher off on their own is, um, it's probably, I mean, I don't know. We'll find out, but I, I'm sure it was a little more involved than that. And I'm wondering to what degree, now that we've faced this, you guys have, uh, published a memorandum to staff, giving them better guidance to fill in these obvious failures and gaps. Have you guys done that? 
We have not sent out a memorandum to uh, administrators, but we have had the conversation with our administrators at our meetings as to what the expectation is. We also, I have had a conversation with the administration at the high school about making sure that they have their teachers um, reviewing what types of ancillary writings they may be sharing and that there is a checklist that has been developed by Bridget Barry and uh, she has shared that with all of her teachers. As so that, that, that's a, a remediation she's put in place based upon correct. what just happened? Correct. Um, and then Anne, or I guess back to you, Mark, because I think you do middle school. Did, you, did I mean, the episode at Western Middle School, you know, I, mean, I don't know whether that thing should have been taught or not. It definitely shouldn't have been taught with that controversial subject without engaging parents, to Ms. Hirsch's point. Parents should have been aware of that if it was gonna be something as controversial as that, so that they could participate in the educational process. Um, but the other thing that came out is, I, that was originally presented as something done by that teacher by themselves, but it was subsequently revealed that that lesson was developed with an academic coach from uh, Havemeyer headquarters. So I'm, I'm wondering, Mark, to what degree, so that that kind of episode doesn't happen again, what guidance has been given there? Do the academic report coaches, do the academics, um, not academic, math coaches, so many humanities coaches, so on and so forth, I guess we got rid of those. Do they just report to you, Mark, or do they report to somebody else? They report to me, Peter. K uh, including K-8? Uh, this year, they report to me. Uh, we, as I said, uh, Mark and I have been collaborating a lot uh, every day, <laughs> and we have looked at what was in place and how we needed to change it to be more effective and mm -hmm. to be more supportive to administrators and teachers. Mm -hmm. So currently, I, I supervise them, but Mark and I, again, meet with them together and we invite them to our administrative meetings to make mm -hmm. sure that they know what the expectation is and what we're talking about and the support that they can give the teachers when needed. And we also have the coordinators attend those meetings uh, bi-monthly or bi-weekly. I can't remember which it's getting yeah, to yeah, me, yeah. but um, we have them attend those meetings as well so that we can really open the lines of communication we mm -hmm. do not want to have the silos that have been um, have been in the central office. And I believe that this structure that we're looking at now and we're revising and developing and changing and learning about is really going to make a positive difference. Yeah, I, I hope it's true. We're the only district around us. Stanford, Norwalk, Fairfield. Uh, Westport, Darien, New Canaan, we're the only one around us with this structure. And, you know, uh, as I say, I try to stay out of that stuff because that's the purview of the, but we're the, everybody should know we're the only one who's organized this way to do this. And if you guys want to organize this way, that's your prerogative, but it's got to work. Um, Mark and Ann, one other thing I'd, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to, hold on one sec, Peter. One other thing I'd like to ask is, you guys presented a curriculum review cycle. Um, it was presented to the board. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to encourage us now, based on recent events, to probably take that up in the curriculum committee again, just so we can all stay aligned on what you guys are planning on working on. And uh, we can help and support you in that work so that um, this moves forward effectively. All right, thank you. We are going to move on to our next agenda item, which is the strategic plan update. So Mr. Chair, the floor is yours. Oh boy. Um, okay, uh, thank you everyone. Um, let me just uh, pull up some, some notes here. Um, as you'll know, we provided a strategy update uh, earlier in 2021. Um, 
let me just remind you where we are in the strategy process. Uh, we have a lot on our plate, so it's easy to get lost. Um, just a reminder to board members, we have an existing strategy. We all voted on that unanimously last June to extend it until replaced. So the administration should be executing against what the current strategy is, because um, we may never replace it. Um, but in the meantime, that's what they should be working with. Uh, you'll recall we had a working session to review and validate and modify our vision and mission. That was a long time ago, pre-COVID. Um, but the point was we came away with a clear concept um, and uh, there was consensus amongst the board of what's in there and moving forward based upon that agreement. So we got that part done. We're now at the part of the process where we're surveying key stakeholders to make sure all their voices are heard in this process. Um, you might remember uh, if you've forgotten that uh, our committee, uh, which is Karen, Karen and I supported by uh, Dr. Jones. Um, we went and looked at information that we would need as an input uh, to any revision of strategy in an effort not to be redundant and prevent uh, survey fatigue, because there are a lot of surveys that have been uh, out with uh, the public. We went and looked at what information do we already have from existing surveys. A uh, good example of that would be the annual panorama survey, which is looking at um, student engagement, staff engagement, a whole bunch of different types of engagement. And what we did is developed a survey that is before you, that is the minimal set of things that are not available in other surveys that we think would be necessary to know uh, for the board to engage in a meaningful conversation about strategy, which is about um, future goals, um, future vision, what big ideas uh, we wanna coalesce around. And by the way, that's quite different than um, implementation and execution. Frequently those two things get a little mixed up. So at this point, we're at the point where we want to survey parents of our 9,000 students to discern their wants, desires, expectation, goals, points of view about where they want Greenwich Public Schools to go in the future. Um, our committee, just uh, by way, has been working on this for a long time. Uh, we're not really that far off cycle. Um, we were always delayed in putting this survey out because we had other surveys that were in front of parents, particularly uh, the work that uh, got scheduled for the um, special education assessment. Uh, we didn't want surveys crashing on top of parents at the same time. So uh, it would have been better if we had done this earlier in April, uh, but we are where we are and it, we're not that far off schedule. Uh, just by way of background, our committee met eight times for an elapsed time of two full days to develop this survey. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth. Um, I operate where we haven't brought it forward until we could get a unanimous vote out of the committee. Um, I, could have pushed this through with a not unanimous vote much earlier, uh, but I did not want to do that. I tend not to work that way. I didn't bring something forward to the board that doesn't have the unanimous support and all the different stakeholders who were participating in our committee uh, were heard and their um, wants, desires, inputs uh, were incorporated. Just by way of, um, uh, recognizing people who support us. I'd really particularly like to thank uh, Jennifer Negrin. For those of you who don't know Jennifer, she's a longtime GPS parent volunteer. Um, her kids have now moved on into great colleges coming out of Greenwich High School. Uh, but she is a uh, well-recognized uh, expert in research and analytics. Um, she used to run uh, research and analytics at the largest public relations organization in the world. And she was the executive vice president about that. So we're really thankful to have her expertise um, reviewing and guiding us in the preparation of the survey. And fortunately, she's agreed to kind of help us in addition to running her own consultancy uh, in between 
and it was really helpful. Uh, the survey is before you um, and uh, in the interest of time, I'm sure you've all read it. Um, it has four sections in it. Uh, just highlight the first section is to try to determine what parents know and think about the current strategy. Um, and that'll help inform us a lot going forward. Um, then it's to try to discern attitudes and confirm attitudes about um, what parents want their school system to be and focus on and, and what they want it to be in the future. Um, Tony Jones asked us to um, add a section to discern community attitudes about educational equity and whether uh, how people think about that as a challenge in the district. So we added that, that's section number three. And then section number four is to ask parents to prioritize what they think is important in their education of their children. Uh, Cause strategy is always about choosing where to focus, um, not always what to add. It's actually a process of focus and reduction. Um, but it's also the purpose of that section is to um, get feedback from the public about what they think we do well and where we think we could improve. So uh, the survey is before you. Uh, we'd like to take any input that you have. We want to take that, answer any questions you have. Uh, Karen and, and I, Karen and Karen and I will be a triple act in this thing. And um, we want to get any feedback and then our plan is to move into execution, put this in the field in uh, early May. Before we uh, take from all the members, I don't know if Karen Hirsch or Karen Kowalski wanted to add anything. I know you've, uh, you've been part of this process as well. So this is, I'll add something. So it, just to give you some back, background on how we came to our process, over the course of time, um, we did through, we looked at other um, strategic plans throughout the country in various school districts, looking at school districts that seemed a lot like ours, both from a size component as well as um, just geographics uh, to make sure that we could, you know, have a model to work off of. So we did that as well as we looked at various other surveys. We also took into account surveys that are also going out um, in our district at various times that we could be using data from. We wanted to make sure that this survey in particular, um, noting, noting that parents could have survey fatigue at this point, given everything that we've asked them to do, was um, very direct and to the point in order to get to what we thought um, were the most, you know, to get the most information that we could out of the fewest questions as possible. Um, so through the, the lot of research that um, all of us did, I'll, I'll note Karen Hirsch did a tremendous amount of research as we all know on the board, she's really good at it, uh, helped out tremendously. We worked through a whole host of questions, making sure that everything was, that we could get this captured into to again, get the most information we could uh, based upon, as I said, models from other jurisdiction, other school districts that we thought were characteristically similar to ours. Thank you. Karen Hurst, do you wanna weigh in as well? Um, we, we did, we reviewed a ton of surveys, including the ones that we've shared with parents in the past. And the committee certainly did agree on um, areas that we wanted to get feedback from parents on. Um, you know, I, I know we also need to, uh, survey the staff as uh, whatever we put forward is something that they'll have to uh, to be able to deliver on. Um, you know, I, I know there were differences uh, of opinion on, on how things were worded and, and things that were um, uh, included um, and, you know, which is why we're sort of bringing some of this forward to the board to, I guess, look through an opine so that we can sort of make sure that we have something that uh, that is going to get us the best data possible for us to revise our current strategic plan, um, sort of to make sure that we deliver to every single student the, uh, the best education and uh, quality education that we can. And that's sort of where I'm at. 
Thank you. All right, Ms. Downey. Um, okay, a couple of questions. Um, first, you talked about getting information from other key stakeholders. I assume that means staff and mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. How are we going to go about getting that information? Well, um, some of it we already have because they've been surveyed over the past few years. Uh, you, uh, the other thing you should know, uh, which I think uh, we've shared before, is because the board's gotten this background. Uh, the most important thing you should know is that on an annual basis, right, we, as a board, we've even commissioned some surveys of students right. that have been done by the administration. So that information is there and available. And you feel yeah. that's well, I mean, just in terms of the types of questions those past surveys have asked yeah, are we on looked point at the, we looked, to what we, you want. And that was- we, we, looked at, we looked at the questions, but everybody else should do it too. Um, the most important one is the panorama survey, because the mm -hmm. panorama survey is a lot about student engagement. You know, is it relevant? Is it working for you? So on and so forth. It also tends to get at questions that uh, Karen Hirsch was particularly concerned about, which is the degree of family and community engagement. We had a lot of debate about that. I, I you know, I think you get a lot about family and community engagement. My own view as a strategist doing this in in my real life is critical, critical question, but it's really, that's about implementation and execution and it's less about strategy, but um, important nonetheless. So as an example, um, what we agreed to do is working with Dr. Jones, they're generating now, she and Jen Lau, I believe it is, um, are generating uh, the next version of Panorama, which will go out in May. And she does not have the questions yet. And they will pull them from a question bank that's available from the people who provide Panorama as well as custom questions. And uh, we've asked uh, Karen Hirsch uh, to be our liaison from the strategy committee to uh, working with Tony Jones and Jen Lau, uh, particularly so that those kinds of questions uh, are reflected in whatever comes up in this next version of the panorama survey. But to and your point there, made, but like now does, by doing this in May and mm -hmm. panorama is going to be in May and the points that several people made already about survey fatigue, do we think yeah. it's really wise to be doing them in, in a relatively close time frame? because are people going to just tune out or is well, this we better? Talked, we so, I'm just, I'm just like, we like, talked, we talked about that. It's a really good question. We talked about it. Um, I mean, this thing, I would be, I'm this concerned, thing yeah. should have already been in flight. And but what's done what, is done. So, you yeah. Know. So, right. So, I think what makes sense is this should be in flight the first week in May. Panorama will be in flight at the end of May. And that will be a buffer uh, between those two. Panorama and also has Panorama also has other audiences. Mm -hmm. So this so one. we're not worried only... about cannibalization that they do one and not the other. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I'm not, but if you crash them on top of each other one week right after the other, yeah. So mm -hmm. if this, if we delay all this, then we need to reorganize ourselves. Okay. Um, but yeah, then now what about? I would yeah. just add to that point. Look, I think if you spread them out by you know three to four weeks i think that's the right time period to spread them mm -hmm. out by but i also think that um and what we do think is that there are some helpful data points in the panorama survey as there have been in the past um along similar questions so we would essentially be getting you know similar we'd be getting data right and answering from both surveys relatively in the same time period which i think would be helpful in trending the mindset and the understanding of the of the parent and the audience at the target audience in shaping the strategic you know our strategic plan going forward so mm -hmm. there wouldn't be a a delay okay. or staleness in the data that we're looking at yeah, okay I think, the, I think the other thing is just to set expectations guys um d d don't think of this as absolute that's the problem with it people tend to think of this as absolute what you have to do is you have to get out there you have to get information then you're going to learn something. And if it if it validates things that we know that we have already learned by looking at longitudinal data that we already have, 
then that's good because it's validating. Mm -hmm. But we should totally be open to, I know I am, I would encourage everybody else to think, hey, if three or four things come up, we may have to go create another survey. It may not be with parents, maybe mm -hmm. targeted at, at staff. Well, you, to you that point, I, so what is an iterative the plan thing, to, not a yeah. not a one and done. That's the that's too rigid to support a successful strategy process. And what is the plan to survey the staff? Okay, so Panorama will get the parents and the students, and this would be for the parents. And then, where does the staff component come in? Well, it depends on what you want to know, right? So. Well, if, if, if we're talking about our strategic plan and we're talking about, you were saying all well, stakeholders, right? I mean, they're a significant stakeholder because they're implementing our strategic plan on a daily basis. So how, what, are we going to survey them? Are we going to do focus groups? What, what is the plan to get their input? It, as I said, it depends on what you're trying to ask. And I think mm -hmm. what we've talked about is depending on what we need to know, we would run that through Tony and then Tony would figure out, Dr. Jones would figure out how best to collect that information from the staff. Mm -hmm. she, um, she, she, my understanding is from the conversations we've had, particularly last November, when we talked about these surveys, mm -hmm. is Tony has a whole plethora of mechanisms by okay. which she connects with the staff, whether that be through her staff meetings through focus groups through informal conversations and what have you we tried mm -hmm. not to get in the middle of that christina and dictate mm -hmm. that i think mm -hmm. the important part as it relates to the staff is, is the way we've approached this is and as i say the staff has been surveyed so we already have some data is okay. it the most current you know we we could go make this a big you giant can make ocean crazy. exercise we're trying not to do that we're trying to get it focused and you feel confident that to the extent whatever metric, whatever hit ratio on parents you have, you feel that this will elicit the data that you need to move forward? That we need. That we need, yes. yeah. That yes. we, you, we, you, the committee, we, the board. Well, yeah. I, I really think it's important because you, if you think about this, this is data that is going to provide a framework and insight to where when we sit down, because the step that comes after this is we sit down as a group and we look at this and we say, what does it tell us? And then we need to move on to a conversation that says, what do we want our, um, what do we think about our current strategy? And what as a group in a workshop, uh, if we think we need to make significant changes to that, somebody says, I want to I'll give you an example. Based on the feedback, I think we should toss out uh, personalized learning and do something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. That that's, we're trying to get information. So that's an informed conversation, not just eight people sitting around a table okay. opi opining. Okay. Um, and I, so I, I have a couple of little points, but I'm not going to bother words. No, go ahead. Here. I'll just shoot you an email with my, my thoughts on some of the questions. Okay. All right. And, and do me a favor, just cop, you can copy all three of us. I was planning to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, yeah, I just did not use time up at our meeting. So thank you. Okay. All right, Miss Olson. Um, uh, same, I may shoot an email just with like a question or two, but um, just as a, well, thank you for doing this, first of all. And, and just, um, just as a, as a uh, general question or comment, I guess, you know, in, in the beginning it says like 27 questions should take about 20 minutes to complete. And I, I'm sure you probably already cut it down right i'm sure you probably already are trying to pick like the most important um you know cut into subsections and trying to pick the most important i'm just thinking of myself and my own family you know two working parents three kids and if i was like oh this survey is going to take me 20 minutes you know i might be like okay i'll do it tomorrow and if, if if there's a way to somehow and i know we need to get data and i know we need to get feedback you're you know trying to get parent feedback and it needs to be specific um if there's a way to, and then if I had another one come out like three weeks or maybe four weeks later, and I was like, didn't I just do a 20 minute survey? Like, that's how I would feel. That's just me. And, um, <laughs> but that's just, maybe I'm stretched too thin, which I probably am. But um, if there's a way to condense it or a, a somehow um, a way to make it slightly less long, I feel like you may get more people participating. Yes. Um, let me just say this again. 
uh, we had eight meetings. Uh, as Karen Kowalski said, you know, there was a lot of people, I shouldn't say, a few people giving lots of input. Um, I, I'm where you are. I would have this thing even shorter than what it is. But um, this is the consensus that came from the three of us and, uh, you know, incorporating Dr. Jones's requests. So um, this is what we're, this is the compromise to get there. But I really appreciate your feedback. All right. Dr. Jones. Um, just two, just two quick items on um, going back to Christina's question. We usually do a teacher survey towards the end of the year, and we're working on that. It's some of the questions really aren't applicable during COVID, um, and so, and we are also trying to on the panorama side to condense um, to answer Megan's question so that you know we can get rid of some of that um, fatigue. The other thing is just to keep in mind that we, you know, we'll try to space them out, but uh, whether or not we can actually do this particular survey the first week in May, just keep in mind next week is the last week in April and that we haven't discussed this and it hasn't started, we haven't started building it uh, inside the survey software. So we just don't know how long it will take. Um, generally, it would be either Jen Lau or myself that would build that. And Jen is also uh, the person that oversees um, all of our um, NGSS testing, SBAC. So she's doing a lot right now and, and she runs the remote school on the back end. So we're gonna work as quickly as we can. I just wanna set realistic expectations um, that we'll get it done, but uh, whether or not it's the first week in May is just gonna depend once we get into start doing the work, how long it actually takes. Thank you. Uh, I wanna take a moment uh, to thank the committee members. You got several uh, sets of draft minutes up today, but you're still missing the five early meetings. It would be great if you could get those posted so that we can see the work that was done there. Uh, and I think you guys are planning to vote on them at some point in the near future. So that would be good to close that loop. Um, I too am concerned about timing, uh, you know, even before Dr. Jones just mentioned not having built this, I'm concerned about where we are in the year. It's the end of the year. There's a lot going on, you know, in terms of priorities, you know, Panorama is really, really uh, important. I understand the importance of this too. We're, we need to balance that out. Um, I absolutely don't recall staff being as, staff being involved enough in the uh, decisions that were made around the last strategic plan. I, in fact, I, I'd be uh, anxious to hear from Carol about her recollections on that, but I, I don't think there was enough that staff involvement. And since they're a part of the, I think it's basically a, uh, you know, there, there's four legs to this. There's the board, there's the administration, there's the staff, and there's the parents, right? And and if we're only uh, looking at a, a couple of those, we're, we're going to miss out on, I think, what would be very, very valuable input. Uh, and to, to put it on Dr. Jones to figure out what the right questions are, that's our job, uh, quite frankly. There are probably different questions than we're going to ask the parents. In terms of the questions, and I know people don't want to spend the time to do this, but I think, you know, it's a public meeting. This is where we're supposed to do this. Uh, and the demographic screener, which is your first set where, you know, it says we're going to be asking about relevant subgroups and, and uh, middle school and all the rest. We don't. The two questions that are shown on the page are actually, uh, are, are any of your children attending or have attended a college or university? We're not even asking them uh, what school their kids are going to. And the next question is, did you or your children attend? Did your children, did your child or children who attended uh, college or university graduate from Greenwich High School? So this is a parent survey. I'm not sure why we're asking college questions. On the um, next section, we're very focused on personalized learning, but if you go back and look at the strategic plan, there's actually three goals there. There's the uh, academic, the personal, and the interpersonal. We're not asking about those at all. Uh, the other thing I'd ask the committee to do is make sure that's the right definition of personalized learning because it's changed so many times through the years. I, I frankly don't know what the current definition is and, uh, and it's probably worth, worth double checking that. Uh, and then when we get into the meat of it, which is I think really what we, what we are most curious about is the, the, the focus, the strengths, the weaknesses, you're asking them to rank order 18 items on a one to seven scale. That, that's just excessive for, for a survey that you know, you're asking parents to invest time in. There's gotta be a better way to do that. Um, I, I just think it's, it's a lot of work. I, I know as a, uh, as a person who gets surveyed all the time professionally, 
I probably would walk away from this one. So I don't know how to better do that. I know why you're doing it because I, I know enough about building a survey that the data would be amazingly useful. I just think from a usability standpoint, that's not gonna, that's not gonna get, uh, get a lot of responses. And I, I think that that presents its own set of problems. So anyway, those are, those are my high level thoughts at this point. I'm not gonna try to wordsmith your questions, but, but I, I think we're missing on the demographic. We're not asking the right questions to figure out what level- Yeah, Peter, I, I um, so uh, there's a piece of information you're missing. I appreciate you asking the question. Um, a demographic screener is standard. Um, we originally in the first draft we got, which came from, that area of it came from uh, Jennifer Negrin, the expert. Um, there were two people on the committee uh, who objected to using a screener, some of the questions that were in the screener, um, in an effort to eliminate endless debate about that. Uh, we decided to use the standard one that's in the tool that we're using, which is SurveyMonkey. Uh, you guys can go look it up if you want. Uh, it's a, a six or seven question thing. But um, on some of these areas of the survey, unfortunately, in the preparation of it, um, you know, it went four or 